All right, everybody, welcome back to the bunker. Uh, tonight, as you know, um, this is being pre recorded, but it is uh, the 6th of June. 06, so uh, a crazy date at that, but I've had an absolutely wonderful day, and tonight we have a very special guest. Um, it's the second appearance here at the bunker. Uh, we have one of my favorite scholars and researchers into the true origins of mankind, and he, this cat has an immense knowledge on the occult and esoteric symbols and their meanings. Um, tonight we have Mr. Michael Tessarian with us. Uh, Michael is the author of Atlantis, Alien Visitation, and Genetic Manipulation, and also has just produced this fantastic new video series, Origins and Oracles, which is six programs, uh, consists of 22 DVDs total. It's over 60 hours of an amazing encyclopedia of knowledge on the most fascinating and revealing subjects. And also, this July 9th on uh, Sci-Fi Channel, he will be doing... Uh, be on an NBC presentation on Atlantis, so that's another thing to look forward to and mark on your calendars. Uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight, Michael. How's everything going? Thank you, Thomas, for uh, inviting me back. Oh, man, anytime. You know that. That's, it's always a pleasure. Um, so how's everything going with the uh, videos that you've just come out with? I know those have been out for about, what, three weeks now, two and a half? About a month, a little bit over a month. I think the release date was July 27th, and you know we've pretty much been selling out every day. Um, recently, in the last, uh, I was on coast to coast um, last week, and uh, there was a lot of interest in the subversive use of sacred symbolism um, DVD, which I already saw was, you know, selling well, and uh, because it's just so topical and it's so uh, controversial, but needed. It's a, it's a area of controversy that I think a lot of people are tuned into right now because of the excesses of Madison Avenue and just this incredible, you know, dominance of the media and. Uh, you know, there's no way that anybody can address any kind of adversarial energy that's happening in our world and not address the media and not address this uh, basic psychic dictatorship that's happening in our midst. So, you know, that one is really uh, flying out the door. And I'm glad to see that because um, of all the six programs that you mentioned in the Origins and Oracle series, five were not even planned by me more than two years ago. But the one that was planned by me was uh, for a long long time has been this one on subversive symbolism to do justice to that subject it's really not that easy to do it on a website you see or to even do a little book on it you know because you're dealing with visuals you're dealing with symbols and it just took the, the video dvd age to really do a thorough you know a proper presentation on that and go much further than most critics of madison avenue have done i mean there's a lot of people out there who've written books who have exposed the fact that these uh, advertisements and so on are pernicious, but they have very much not gone into the occult side of it to show just the antiquity of some of these symbols and that they are related to the zodiac, that they are related to the ancient, you know, languages of the world, and and that's where my work goes into the occult side of it, talking about the Freemasons and and all of this. So this, um, I'm really glad that the subversive symbolism. DVD was actually got to be part of this um, series because to me that's one of the most beloved subjects. Brian Hall had given me an opportunity in Conspiracy Con, I think in 2003, uh, if I'm not mistaken, to do a two hour talk on the subversive use of sacred symbolism, and that also had a tremendous response, especially from, you know, mothers and fathers and people who want their kids to know about this uh, subject, you know. So that one has been very much. Uh, highlighted right now just in the last couple of weeks but they've all been flying out the door all over the world we've had you know orders from all over the world and a lot of people have been waiting a long time for this it was a two-year project and it, it really took a lot of time to get everything right so that there was the right setup all the way across the board you know because it's very elaborate when you do a project like this and you know i don't like a lot of middleman i don't want a lot of editing i had i had a certain vision that i wanted to encapsulate you know, and that was more important to me. It was more like, you know, an artist with his canvas. It, you know, it's important the way it came out for me. If, if I liked it, then I knew everybody else would like it. But first, I had to please myself because there was so much investment of energy and time in this project. Oh, but very much so. I have the first two videos of your collection. I don't have the... Uh the subversive use of the media, or the symbolism in media, I should say. I do have your conspiracy con lecture on that, though, which is fascinating. Um, but your first two DVDs that I have, 
I just really enjoyed all the thorough research that was done. Um, most of the information I was aware of through your research already, but not exactly, you know, where it came from, how, and, you know, because like you said, there's so much information. It's very nice to have something so detailed and such a wonderful presentation on it. Well, we were also trying to make sure that there was a theme running through them all. There's no point making an overarching program title like Origins and Oracles if they're all going to be very, very separate. They're all different subjects. You know, Atlantis 2012, you know, the Celts, the Goddess, you know, Astrotheology. They're different subjects, but you see, through my work, it runs this theme. And that was what had to be given true thought, as you know, especially in regards to 2012 DVD, which is also very popular, you know, my take on that subject is very different than a lot of other people who've been researching that. But we wanted to do the series so that there was the same refrain, the same kind of uh, sort of a conceptual type of thing running through them so that they weren't just going to be more beads, you know, thrown around without a thread, which is what you often get when you see programs on television, is that they give you tiny little snippets of information, but, they, you know, you're begging for more. And then they're very short, and they're edited for time and for content, and they merely are appetizers in a way. And, you know, we are, you know, decades past, and we're still not given the full story about some subjects, which really we deserve the truth. You know, I was very conscious of, of the, the fact that we as humanity, you know, deserve the truth. We each deserve to know what it is that has been hidden from us. And we're living in an exceptional age in which we do have more information than our forefathers ever had. We've talked about this on the previous show, that, you know, just a hundred years ago, our forefathers didn't have, you know, the literacy or the access to the libraries and colleges and, and universities, you know, in mass that we enjoy now. So we're in an exceptional age, and therefore there should be an acceleration of knowledge. There should be um, more people hankering and craving after the knowledge, and therefore we should then have the programs and the, and the shows and the movies and the documentaries that do thorough justice to these age-old um, subjects. And it's, it's really, in my mind, pathetic that still people, you know, even in the digital age, with the new technology, with videos and DVDs, are still putting out 55-minute things, one-hour little things, you know. And to me, that's just so bogus. I want more. So when I, when I created these, that's what I did. I said, you know, I'm going to start at the beginning, we're going through the middle, and we're going to reach the end. You know, it's, it's going to be a thorough work, an encyclopedic type of thing, as you said, so that, you know, we're not just having little sound bites and, and little appetizers, People can really, you know, use this uh, set for a comprehensive, thorough education in some of the most incredible subjects of alternative history and conspiracy and controversial matters about the history of the world and so on, and have it really, you know, big bites. This is, a, this is key because we, we need to have the true story now. Also, I was very concerned about the fact that, you know, not everybody out there can do the 25, 30 years of research in these subjects that I and some others have done. And, and, of course, they shouldn't have to. The whole point is that those who have done that kind of research should then be able to communicate it simply and directly to an audience in a non-exploitative way with their good at heart. And that also was one of the, you know, the ideas of this series. Yeah, very much so. And, and also, people can get this at Terrascopes.com, correct? Well, they have their own website. Oh, they, that's right. The Origins and Oracles does have its own website. Yeah. You do have, like, seven or eight websites. I've got about five or six or something like that, and uh, we definitely had the Origins and Oracles have their own website, so it's originsandoracles.com, um, although, of course, you can get to the merchandise stuff through Tarascopes as well. Yeah, and there's also a lot of great information talking about, you know, the steps through all the Origins and Oracles, and it's a, it's a nice read, it's a... 30, 45 minute read depending on your speed of reading and comprehension. Um, we have testimonials flooding in, so there's, we've, we've added the testimonials to that site so people can get a, more of a clear understanding of the impact that they are having. Very nice. Uh, and if people want to also go to michaeltessarian.com, that's like a navigation page where they can browse all the different websites that I have easily as opposed to writing down all the different names of the websites. But uh, sure, you know, michaeltessarian.com will make uh, looking at the different websites very easy because we've also done some major updates to uh, my, my uh, numerology website, you know, as well. And then there's the blog and whatnot. One thing I also found fascinating was your links. I could not believe it. I sat there for, it was maybe, I don't know, it was before we talked the first time, maybe a month or so, but I sat there for half a day, at least seven, eight hours, just going through links and reading. 
and I couldn't I couldn't believe all the information just from your links. They were they were set up very well. It was amazing all the information you provide through your websites. I was quite impressed with that. Thank you. That, that's important too. I mean, that uh, page you see is a resource page. An extreme resource page. You, yeah, it's a, uh, it's amazing. I just, the links itself are amazing. They're phenomenal. Well, that started off as again, you know, trying to bring people to the awareness that it's not just me, you know, saying all of this stuff. That uh, I'm, I'm no authority. You know, that I these, those links were meant to display my mentors, the people that uh, have already worked in this field. Four years, I uh, tried to make it uh, that you know people would realize that there, this is a whole subject that's been studied for years. That it is a collaborative effort. That it's, there's no one person has all the answers, you know. So the links page is you know is so needed, and a lot of people visit that constantly because I'm always you know talking about it and always referring people to go, hey, hey, where did you get the sources for that, or where did you get the sources for this piece of information? You know, usually the links page is, you know, wherever I find a really incredible source of something, I put it up there, you know, again, the internet, look how brilliant that is, can you imagine having to send out type information or... Oh, exactly, you don't know how much time you saved me, you saved me probably five years of research on Google. (laughs) Well, imagine we didn't have the internet, you know, I keep telling people not to take it for granted. Not at all. How how would anybody be disseminating... You'd go old and tired trying to, even if you had a network of people, just take that links page. How on earth would anyone ever, you know, in in print media, be sending all of that information and then expecting, you know, uh, folks to read it? Or, you know, it would be impossible. Whereas on the Internet, millions all over the world can do it instantly. This is what I'm talking about, the, the incredible age that we're in. And therefore, there's a higher demand now on the teachers of truth to say, okay, you know, um, you've been talking about these subjects for long enough. How come it's so paltry that apart from maybe David Icke, you know, and one or two others, mostly the uh, DVDs and the videos out there are very, very badly produced. They're extremely short. They're very appetizer-like. You know, they're expensive. You know, they're hard to get. You know, all, there's all sorts of uh, also just stylistic uh, problems within this movement. It's, the movement is not itself as co- cohesive as I would like. You know, um, and it becomes difficult for people, you know, to really hone in on a particular okay you have the web and you have other kinds of information but you know I am a complete believer that's why we spent so many years doing this series is because I'm a total believer in that you must use the tools that are at hand uh, to get the message across to the human race about what is going on you just use the tools at hand don't complain about it just get on with it and do it and see if it can be done and you know this project has proved us true it's proved it's proved the, the fact of the matter that you can use the latest technology even if you don't have a lot of resources, you can still do a really wonderful job. It doesn't need to, you know, be be um, uh, like you know looking like rubbish. And so, you know, I'm very pleased. In the last 30 days, there's just been an absolutely overwhelming response, and I know that's going to continue. That's fantastic. Well, tonight we have a, you know, quite a deep subject to talk about, and I'm going to give you complete floor tonight. Um, and tonight we are going to be talking about Ananakton and the uh, uh, the cult of Anton. I'm sorry. And, but before that, if we could, I have a couple listener questions, and that way we can just get those over with, and we can get right into the goods of what's coming up. Sure, sure. And uh, the first question I have, both these questions I find quite interesting, so I hope everybody listens up on these. Um, first question is, concerning the up-and-coming 2012 date, the photon belt, along with the galactic alignment of the sun, is happening for the first time in about 26,000 years. If we follow this concept, then that means these events have already happened while the Atlanteans have been on Earth. Could you please elaborate and possibly explain how the Atlanteans dealt with this phenomena, or if perhaps our current concept of time may be flawed as it pertains to celestial events? Well, our sense of timing is not flawed. And this is a question that has come up many times when I was looking into this. Now, you see, what is flawed is the idea that time is cyclical. Time is spiralic. There seems to be a habit in this old Einsteinian closed universe uh, concept that everything moves in these static circles. Well, because if you grow up looking at a clock or a watch, you know, if you look at a clock or a watch, and you have the calendar, and you, you know, you're mind controlled into the concept of the year, then of course it's just like you're basically like the old flat worlders were when they they thought everything was flat or you're like the old uh, you know Vatican pumping out disinformation that the whole universe you know 
you know, orbits around the Earth. I mean, this preposterous kind of nonsense. Anyone who's done their homework in celestial mechanics and anyone who's even observed how nature is in fact uh, organized, they know that there's a thing called the uh, phi ratio and, and the Fibonacci series and that there is this um, spiralic fractal type of creation. So I am not a believer in a fixed cycle of anything. So, and, and especially in these very large uh, cycles. So when people say that the last, you know, photonic action, if those who are believers in the photonic action, and remember, I am just presenting a lot of this subject. I, I'm not necessarily still a believer in that, you know, it's the photon belt or anything like that. I'm just putting forward to people some of the most coherent theories about what might be coming our way. Uh, let me also say that, that in the DVDs that I do, I'm not advocating a personal belief system. I'm presenting for people the most coherent theories that are out there you know, that other scholars have worked on. However, the most important thing, especially with this uh, question that you have, concerns this um, spiralic motion. You have to think of it like concentric circles or spiral, just in exactly the same way as the Fibonacci series operates. So instead of thinking as, as fixed, what would happen if this uh, photonic, you know, return, the return of the photon belt, is not just something that for ad infinitum for millions and for millions of years is a fixed static you know uh, circle of 26,000 years that to me is just not how the universe works it is a continually you know um, it's, it's a spiralic action just in exactly the same way as the Fibonacci series is so I think that that means that the last one was further back if you get my meaning yeah very much so right all right, well, the second question we have here, and this will be the last question, then we'll, uh, we'll go on from here. Um, if celestial events are reflections of our collective unconscious, and the planets themselves are alive and aware, then is it possible that we are reflections of them, and if so, from whom or where does consciousness derive? Well, the whole thing about pr um, prophecy, and the whole thing about the stars when we're talking astrology, which is, in fact, it's one of my major work in life, is to talk about the inner zodiac, this phenomena of the inner zodiac, and that there isn't any magic rays up there, and it's not about, you know, rocks affecting space, uh, excuse me, rocks in space affecting consciousness or destiny or anything like that. The external zodiac is just like tea leaves. It's just a mirror of consciousness. And when you, the person who's reading tea leaves is not going to question what brand of tea it is. That's supremely unimportant, right? What, what brand of tea it is when the person is reading the tea leaves. So when you have all these miscellaneous kinds of astrology out there and everyone is trying to prove these magic rays, it's never going to happen because that's not how it works. And the Western world should already know the answer. And that is because it's all consciousness. It's all consciousness. Intention. If it wasn't, my goodness, what kind of a world would we be living in? We'd be living in a very deterministic kind of world. Well, it's like the way I've looked at it, um, I totally agreed with Mr. Bill Hicks when he said we are all one consciousness experiencing ourselves subjectively. Mm -hmm. I've, I've always felt that. Um, it, I find it makes sense and I'm comfortable with that. And some people are like, well, how can you just leave it at that? I'm like, why can't you? Um, well, exactly. And the conscious mind... When it comes to consciousness itself, what we know as ego consciousness is an extremely small part of the matrix of, of, of mind, of being. We know that 99 something percent of what our thinking process, of our, uh, you know, uh, thought process is unconscious. This has been proven not only by the psychologists, but it's now been backed up by even the, from the science community, people like uh, Bruce Lipton have shown this, that the intentionality of ego consciousness is minute. So, of course, then, what is this unconscious doing? And it is this unconscious part of us that is projecting this matrix of uh, the stars and the meaning of the constellations see, outside. The constellations are within. Man is a walking, living zodiac. And it just it, it's just a way that we've been brought up, that we unfortunately are being conditioned to believe that external physical energy and internal psychic energy are two separate things. They're not. And all people who are on the road to enlightenment, anyone from the shamanistic tradition, knows that there are deep, intimate rapports between the microcosm and the macrocosm, and in fact, there may be no difference whatsoever. It's just an illusion. It's just the same fish seen from two sides of the same tank. They give you the idea that there's two fish in the tank. 
And this is unfortunately what most people are laboring under, and of course those who live that kind of life, when we are under that kind of delusion and that kind of division, then we are inheriting complete and utter pain and anxiety. Our, the anxiety, the pain, the punishment that we suffer as human beings in this world is based on the fact that we are living in a state of illusion, where we are literally confined to something that is so far removed from our state of being, and therefore we are in disobedience of the laws of the universe and will suffer as a result. The magicians know this. There wouldn't be as much anxiety and pain and suffering and sorrow. There wouldn't be as much sadism and violence and all of this other stuff going on in this world as plaguing us if man was in his center and if man was, you know, in accordance to the laws of nature and had an understanding that he is within himself the temple of the living God. And therefore, when we know external things, like, what was the question again, the first line of that question? It was very interesting. Uh, if celestial events are reflections of our collective unconsciousness, or unconscious, and the planets themselves are alive and aware, then is it possible that we are reflections of them? Well, the planets are not aware at all. It's, a, this, it's just that mind has an effect on matter, and matter also has an effect on mind. And this is where the art of astrology came from. But you see, the true tenets of astrology have been thrown aside. It's just like in this country, it's the same problem as when you're trying to address the you know, great tyrannies of government and the conspiracy movement, as well as the New Age movement, seems to have left consciousness at the door. Well, it's the same thing in astrology. They seem to have left the inner zodiac at the door. It, it's bizarre to me that this, is, this has happened. So in my work, if I can accomplish only two things, which is that in the conspiracy movement and in the New Age movement, can we please bring back consciousness as a factor here? when we're looking to the root of, you know, uh, social and domestic and governmental militaristic problems, why are we not addressing human consciousness in the, in the Jungian Freudian way? That's a major question I have. I think maybe maybe one of the reasons is like what you mentioned the last time we spoke. I mean, at the time of birth, you know, with the bright lights uh, taking our melatonin and everything else. I mean, we are we are brought up oh, basically enslaved as far as uh, our awareness. Well, there's also, there's also an overt campaign. There was also an overt campaign in this country by the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, to get as far away from the, you know, the trunk of Freud and Jung as possible and to create all of these hybrids of psychology, which are interesting, interested, interesting in themselves, there's no doubt about that, but they are, they are very uh, peripheral. They do not actually go into the work of the great masters. There's very little you know, uh, um, work in this country that's based on Wilhelm Reich or R.D. Lang, you see, so there's a conscious also um, downplaying of the great psychologists. Now in astrology, as we were saying, they're leaving the concept of the inner zodiac. You'll hear, you, you will run into infinite amount of people who are into astrology and have no idea of, of the way that, it, the, you know, the outward planets, the stars work. How, what, the, how, what is the connection between the twelve, the twelve up there, and the twelve within? These are completely anathema to most people who are in astrology, and yet most of these people will then have on the front cover of their books Jungian astrology, psych psychological astrology, esoteric astrology. And then you open the book, and they, they, it's like they never even read their own name of their own cover. They, they go off the, you know, they're so far removed from what that's really all about. It's pathetic. And this is, again, needs to be rectified. If there's, a, if there's something I can bring to the world in my lifetime, you know, it'll be readdressing this point that everything that happens outside of you is articulated to consciousness. I mean, we're going to need to really relearn this in the next couple of years, you know, in the countdown to 2012. That's the central issue of, of the next couple of years is to re-understand the intimate connections between the psychic energy and the physical energy, the microcosm and the macrocosm. You know, it's the five-pointed star of the inner world of a man and the hexagram, the six-pointed star of the external world. These two stars, internal man, external man, they are not separate, and they must be divided. There's a, uh, they must not be divided. There's a, there's a connection there between these states. And, you know, we're, we have not learned it, even from the teachers when we were taught this, we were, we were very much uh, recalcitrant. So what's going to happen now is that nature itself is going to uh, conspire to create situations in everybody's life so that they're, they're going to have their face put in these facts. Because it's so late in the day, we have so many intellectuals, you have every kind of organization, you have every kind of bricks and mortar institute, you have internet, you have books galore, and yet man is still arrested inside.
some of the most basic primitive things that every school child should know when it comes to consciousness, you see, and some of these uh, aspects of consciousness. So it, it's unacceptable. The people are walking the streets, even some of them very much, you know, proficient and educated, so-called, in some of these esoteric areas, and yet they are very backward. They are not addressing some of the key issues. It's almost like they're still in kindergarten, and that's unacceptable. It's unacceptable to be a member of the Western, you know, tradition, to have grown up in the West and not be thoroughly conversant, not just intellectually, but in a practical way, with Freud and with Jung, you see, and R.D. Lang and, and Wilhelm Reich and these great specialists. It's, it's absolutely not acceptable that people do not know this kind of thing. So my work is to infuse back into the movement of the conspiracy movement and also into the New Age movement and the alternative history movement that, look, you why are you leaving this out? So you, you're complaining with one hand that you've got tyrants on Capitol Hill and, and the, the, the world order is worse than it ever has been before. People are dumber than they've ever been before. You know, the earth is in a state of ecocidal chaos. And all these things which you're rightly addressing and need to be addressed, that's fantastic. But where is the common denominator to all of this? What is wrong with the conspiracy movement that we have not understood? That the real war against, you know, from the power brokers, like the, what we call the hidden masters, right, these elect, have we not understood that the main war against us is the a war against consciousness? I would think that's what, you know, I've always felt and perceived because, I mean, I'm lied to and manipulated constantly. And, I mean, consistently through everything, through advertisement, through the media, um, any type of outlet that way. Um, people themselves, because, of course, they're dumbified the same way. And, I, you know, when you were talking about how people are kindergartners on this, I still find myself... Um, you know, i learning constantly, but I still find myself stupefied in so many ways. Um, that's right, and that's because there's so much stimuli out there, there's so many charlatans throwing stuff at us that looks good. You remember, we're coming from a state of total impoverishment and conditioning, like you said. So we will then, you know, anybody who throws us a coin, it's like a panhandler. Anybody who throws us a couple of dollars, we, we look at them like a saint. This is the predicament of the human race, that we're being thrown mere trinkets by a lot of these teachers, so-called, and we're just so gleeful. And it's just rubbish. You know, we're, we're, it's, it's, it's not something that really helps. And th this, is, this can be very frustrating, you know. It can be very frustrating. But there's no way. And I think what has also happened is that when, you know, we have such great scholars out there and they're pointing to the assassinations of, of certain people and they're pointing to the reason for war and they're pointing to the Federal Reserve and its machinations and illegal immigration and, the, you know, uh, AIDS. And, and all sorts of other designer diseases and the whole slew of stuff that we know about. And yet, there seems to be, you need, we, need to, we need to really always be very, very conscious that even though there is all this adversarial action, and it takes on many forms, it's like a huge octopus, and it's both racial and it's ethnic, you see, and it does involve currency, and it does involve uh, social sovereignty and, le and law. Never let us forget when we're understanding this that the ultimate goal of this fight is against consciousness. Or if you want to be, from a Christian point of view, spiritualist point of view, say, it's a war against spirit. Okay, that's the same thing. It is a war against consciousness. Ultimately, the thing that is needed to be destroyed is man's consciousness. And we must never lose sight of that fact. Uh, don't you find also, though, I mean, this, this is what I found through, you know, my years of, of reading and researching. Um, I find that all the religions, I, w I was raised a Christian, um, but I've studied all the great religions because I wasn't convinced um, I, I find they're made by the manipulators themselves all of these religions as as you pointed out in the biggest secret in David Icke's book uh, the Levites um, basically all the major religions come from them um, you know, so I can't never I don't really get the religious aspects anymore I don't understand how some of these great researchers out there can be of a very you know uh a major religious influence. Well, that's that's also one of the uh, most. Uh, in fact, uh, I can tell you that the people of the inner circle that I know, all of the research community and the conspiracy movement, always have that as a major problem. Because how can you be standing on one ship on the port side and pointing to a conspiratorial organization on the on the starboard side and saying you guys are evil? 
you know, and uh, we're going to expose you when you're all on the same, same ship. boat. Yeah, exactly. You, thank you for putting it that way. That was that's a great analogy. And I also want to thank you for the last conversation on how much you helped me out as a human being with the problems of having to explain things to people or your frustrations. Well, it's don't. Um, your explanation on putting the light in someone's face was amazing, and I know I wasn't the only one you helped out on that. I got quite a few responses on that, on how much that has helped people out in their lives. On it's crucial. It's absolutely it crucial. It is, very much so. I you can't tell you how much relief you have given in my life on that, so I'd like to thank you for that note that you gave us last time. Well, I've said that from the stage, and I will say it to the end. That this is a movement that even when people ask you about it, you should be extremely reticent to open the door because there are many, many reasons why people will want to dabble with this. And I, I've always considered this subject sacred. I accept, you know, and therefore I and I found that a lot of people who even you know maybe dabble and want a little bit of anecdotal information, they don't treat it reverently. They they want to kill time. They, they just are into it for tantalizing reasons, and they want to, you know, uh, have you waste all your energy, ex, ex, you know, passionately explaining to them, because they really have nothing better to do. And therefore, you should be very reticent to dialogue with anyone in your midst, unless you're absolutely certain that they've bought books on it, you know, they've spent some money, they've spent some time, and then, in a, in a beautiful, friendly way, there could be a, a very healthy discussion. And then I also, I've always added to that, that then when you go further and you do become a teacher and you set up a website or you're, you know, you're setting up a radio station or you're, you're disseminating information, then above all, you must be very eloquent in your, uh, in your, uh, com you know, in your way of conveying this information. And you must be very conversant with the facts. Um, so, you know, that's where I'm, people like myself are disseminators of this information. And that, that's always my hope is that people will use the information that we create so that they will be conversant with the facts and also then develop a certain eloquence, which is not a uh, angry, you know, in-your-face, fear-ridden type of way, which, of course, a lot of people who get into this movement are very much like that. They need to address it in exactly the same way as if they went to college or if they went to a university class or they're taking a night course. You know, you're expected to present your homework and your work in a very you know, refined and, and loving and reverent way. And it's exactly the same thing with this type of subject matter. I don't know why, again, when people get into this subject matter, they just bring all of their chaos and junk into it. Incoherence, lack of eloquence, you know, utter lack of discernment and discrimination into these matters. You know, and, and, and I know why they are doing that. It's because this is just something for them to do. They don't treat it reverently. It's just something to kill time, to get into, you know, to spin, spin the wheel and also to aggrandize themselves and to look good. Not a lot of people are into this, re into this type of subject matter really for the truth. They're into it because they find it tantalizing. It does have a lot of allure. It is secret, you see, it deals in mystery. And of course, that's very tantalizing to people. They are very attracted by it. But that's a whole different, you know, uh, reason of attraction or interest than the person who really has a deep and abiding love uh, of humanity and a deep and abiding love of all of this Information and we'll treat it reverently. The, the things are w w world apart. You know, we should have known this from the hippie days of the 1960s, and just how irreverently people would deal with certain magical principles. We should have learned that by now. We've had enough charl charlatans in the world, both from the east and the west, that we should realize that by now. But you know, again, our boundaries are very much down, and you can exhaust yourself trying to address and heal and teach your so-called you know, friends and family and people around you, and it will be to no avail. So a person has to sit down and really think about, okay, do they want to do that? Do they want to just you know, um, be content disseminating this kind of information to a small local group? That might be okay for some people. And other people go, well, wait a minute. You know, would it not be better for me to reserve my energy here and get to a wider public audience? And we need, some people need to sit down and really think about that. And that will save them the energy of wasting the energy doing one when they should really be doing the other. Yeah, I hear you there. Um, a little off topic here, but I, I'm extremely surprised. The night is still young, but I'm surprised the, uh, I, the New World Order, the Illuminati, whatever you want to refer to them as, um, I'm surprised they didn't pull anything off today. No, I really, obvious. truly am. It's too obvious. The 666 is 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 um a, it's just a, it's just one of many 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 uh, sacred numbers 
Aren't they meeting up at the Grove right now, or is that next week? Uh, that's uh, the the twenty second. Oh, is it twenty? I thought it was the mid of the month for some reason. I'm sure they'll do some sacrifices. And remember, we're not just talking about one little uh, you know group here. The Power Pyramid is many groups, many factions. So the, the, some people may venerate the 666 more than another group. You see, they all have their own insignias and symbols and, and reverences and rites and rituals. It's, and of course, wouldn't it be too obvious if they went and publicly did something on 666? Yeah, Every that's a, Christian would be leaping out of the woodwork going, see, there's an evil archy ruling the world. It's not going to be as easy as that, I'm afraid. Yeah, you're right, because they do have to boil us like the frog. So uh, Now, you do have a new book coming out, too, don't you? Um, and hopefully late summer... We're putting together um, I've been, uh, another long, long time project uh, called The Irish Origins of Civilization. This is a book that I've been working on since I was about 13 years of age in Ireland when I started my research into the Celtic myths. Well, and those myths are quite interesting. I really like how you put it in earlier shows that I've listened to you on other programs. Um, I try to catch you every time I can, as a lot of these listeners, a lot of my listeners do. Um, Thank you. Well, you, thank you very much. So, for all your information, Michael, your uh, seriously, uh, your research is amazing. But well, this uh, this book is going to blow people away. I really enjoy how you put. I mean, seriously, I, you know, you want to talk about fairy tales? I look at the Bible as one of the largest fairy tales written. Um, I mean, not to offend any Christians either. That's just my personal opinion, and this is free speech radio. Um, but I also find fascinating all the all the fables and the tales we have but there's many legends and written in different ways of the same things and uh of the different creatures that were you know in way back times and written in the fairy tales and how they could have been brought about by the manipulation when they were genetically messing with everything and i find that it's that's totally plausible oh, of course it is and when it comes to um irish mythology it's filled with these you know uh the phantasmagoric uh, entities and all of this phenomena, there's, there's probably not a more magical tradition on the face of this earth than the Irish Celtic you know, tradition, as people obviously know that. And in fact, many of the legends and myths of other countries were actually originally taught to those countries from, from Ireland. From Ireland, exactly. I remember my first time to Europe. Uh, I was in Amsterdam, and I ran into this little shop, and I wish I could remember the name of it. It was the most, oh, it was called the Fantasy Shop, is what it was called. And it was one of the most amazing stores I'd ever walked in in my life. It was, it was incredible. It was amazing. But, uh, it, you know, just looking at everything there has a story. And it was that that in itself was amazing. So everything in Ireland is a story. The place is such a small country. You know, the whole country of Ireland will fit inside Lake Michigan. And yet, mm-hmm. people, you'd be amazed at the history of that land uh, in in so many incarnations of its existence, especially in the most ancient of times. What incredible mysteries have happened in that land? And you know, the telling of the, of that tale started at the turn of the century with scholars like Anna Wilkes and Conor McAdory. And in the 1960s, with uh, you know, Commons Beaumont, who was an expert on the British Isles and its true meaning, uh, and so on. And I'm picking up from them. But the book will also involve a lot to do with Egypt and the ties between Ireland and Egypt. Because if you're talking about Ireland, then you're also talking about the World Druidic College. You're talking about the original Stellar Cult. You're talking about um, the original Christ. You're talking about the f- original worshippers of the Zodiac. You're talking about a worldwide uh, dissemination of sacred knowledge, and you're talking about a group called the Arya, or the true Aryans, not the Aryans that has again been, you know, uh, hijacked. That word was specifically hijacked in the Nazi period for a very important purpose, just in exactly the same way as the word Jew and the word uh, Israelite and the word Hebrew. All of these terms have been hijacked, and it's the most confusing thing to people even within Judaism when they find out that, you know, that these words have nothing to do with those people. And it's confusing when people start to study the history of these races to discover that finally they realize that these words have no place in where we are officially being told that they are. And, and it's the same thing with the word Aryan. I find it funny when people mix Judaism and Zionism as the same thing. That, that's what I mean. Exactly. Different. That, you know, I mean, we, maybe we'll have a show where we get into all that, but just for now, the word Aryan itself is... The word Irish was not with an I, a capital I. It was with an A, the Ari or the Irish. And Ari always meant the sacred ones, the ones of knowledge, uh, the ones of light, the Arya that the, that the Indians talk about who invaded in the north. And when a lot of these people were saying invasions, 
that's also a you know a wrong word. Uh, that's also been put before us to imply certain belligerence which which didn't in fact exist. So the Arya had this world college and the Egyptian theocracy. Of course, when you talk about Egypt, you're talking about an awful long period of time as well. So there's a reason why Egyptology begins at the third, you know, it begins in the uh, third century uh, BC, goes back to the, uh, the only the 32 dynasties that uh, Manetho, the historian, wrote about. There's a reason why they want to start it that late. Is because they're desperate to not let us know what was going on in the earlier dynasties when there was these deep connections between the land of Ireland and the land of Egypt. For instance, like I have on my website, there are several Egyptian personalities, including the king, the, fir the first king of the first dynasty of Egypt, King Menes, is actually buried in Northern Ireland. Oh my, that's, yeah. that's very <laughs> interesting. Wow. Think of this, Queen Nefertiti. Queen Nefertiti's daughter, Meritaten, who's also called Scotia, is buried in northern is buried in, in Southern Ireland, and she's the girl who the princess who gave her name to Scotland. That's very interesting. Well, also, you know, like I said, when I went I went to Europe several times. It's amazing all the Egyptian uh, obelisks that are through throughout Europe, especially in London, in London, in Rome, London, Rome, has, Rome yeah, exactly. Rome has thirteen, and there's never been a real explanation given as to why these obvious pagan Egyptian symbols are there. Not alone the great uh, pyramids that are inside some of the temples, the whole Egyptian iconography. You've got skulls and bones all over the place. You've got huge piazzas. London has all along the River Thames. If anyone goes to England, London, and then goes on the river and takes one of those barge trips, all you'll see going down the river is sphinxes, you see, and obelisks and Egyptian iconography and Egyptian place names. If you're good at word history, you'll notice that even Kent, the very, the very uh, county of Kent, is the ancient name of Egypt was Ken or Kent K E N T Wow so, yeah and this incredible earth works are in the county of Kent because it was a people of Egyptian background who came and founded that that uh, particular that particular county and the whole of the royal families know this the insignias of the royal family are Egyptian and Celtic uh, and the book will go into this but in the meantime in the meantime, if people go onto the Taroscopes website and go to the Astro Theology pages, then they're going to see previews of the book. There's a lot of pictures there that people need to look at. Because the other theme of the book, uh, Thomas, is the full and complete explanation of where all the secret society symbols come from. This has, again, been research that's been going on in America for about 50-odd years, or a little bit even less than that. It's a very new subject when people have started to address the concept of secret societies in this country, and they've started to broach you know, the question of these uh, Egyptian symbolism that is appearing in American milieu, but the thing is they haven't gone anything like far enough. You well, know, isn't the, the, the Masonic Temple, I believe it's Philadelphia, I don't think it's the Washington, D.C. Temple, I believe it's the Philadelphia Temple that's uh, totally Egyptianed out, I mean, it's... Oh, and they're all over the place. But you see, it wouldn't be, again, my problem is that when people say Egyptian, my goodness, you're talking about maybe 25,000 years of time. It's of history. so big. What does that really mean? Very much so. I mean, you're looking at an immense amount of history. Right. So we need to come down and be more specific. And I've been waiting and waiting for you know some scholars to get to this point, and they haven't done it. So then I had to incorporate this in the, in the new forthcoming book. And uh, probably we'll have to do a DVD on it as well, because it's like, okay, can we now be more specific and actually show in detail that these symbols, all of the secret society symbols, when people are tracking them back to the Jesuits and to the Vatican, you see, and through into Judaism and, and into the royal families of Europe, you know, okay, then we go further back. We understand that even some of them are Venetian, and some of them relate to the Habsburg dynasty and all of this. But where is it all really coming from? Why are the symbols Egyptian? What would possess anyone to use Egyptian symbols? And my research has shown that it relates to Akhenaten and the cult of Aton coming out of the 18th dynasty. And to say it another way, that if there was not this character, Akhenaton, if he didn't exist, and he hadn't had the experiences that he had, meaning that if he hadn't been thrown out of Egypt, then I can guarantee you that there would be no such thing as Judeo Christianity in this world, and there would be no such thing as the secret societies, or at least not in the way that we know them today. His, his influence on history, his, his existence, and the actions that he carried out in Egypt during the time of the 18th dynasty, which was you know 14 to 1600 BC, was so important for the world, and no other scholar has really covered this in detail. Everyone that you will hear talking about Akhenaten just lionizes the guy. 
He's one of the most famous, you know, pharaohs. All the websites and the books are just, you know, dribbling over Akhenaten because, of course, the general idea is that he is the creator of monotheism. He's sort of the Christ before the Christ, the sort of well-meaning but misguided semi-enlightened man. And all of this is total bunk. From beginning to end, there's not a shred of truth in it. Quite the contrary. This is one of the most demagogic, despotic, psychopathic, diseased, you know, creatures that has ever lived on the face of this earth. And every machination that you find operating in the world today, the rise of the two religions, Judeo-Christianity, the rise of the major royal dynasties of the world, the rise of the secret societies, and the symbolism that they use dates right back to Akhenaten. And, you know, this is uh, what we have to go into so that we have this peace now, so that the conspiracy movement itself can move forward, so that we really know what this is. Because also, what is Aton? Aton is Adonai. Adonai is Yahweh. So there's the religious tie in there to discover that when the, the sun god of Akhenaton is Aton, which just meant the sun at the horizon. Well, the sun at the horizon, the sun king, the solar god of the solar cult, is the same God as the Jews are worshipping under the name Adonai, or as Jehovah. Then, we understand what, what the true word of Luciferian really means. When you get into this whole thing, you just start to discover why it is that these secret societies would be worshipping a being called Lucifer. There's nothing inherently negative about that name outside a Christian context. All it meant was the sun at the horizon, or the sun in the sign of Leo, when the Egyptian zodiac opened. The sun of the morning, the sun of the beginning of the zodiac. And it's kind of like how you've brought out earlier, too, or not to, on tonight's show, but I've heard you before on, on like Solomon. So Solomon is the same. King Saul, King Saul, the first king outside of Egypt that ruled the Jews, is not S A U L, which has been cunningly uh, connived. It's S O L, Saul, the sun. Nothing more than Akhenaten himself. Then there's also the concept of Luciferianism, the idea that there's a thing, there's many different kinds of light. There's many kinds of, of, of uh, sunlight. The sun is used by secret societies because there's a dark side of the light. So we get confused when we look at Christianity talking about the light. We have secret societies talking about the light and using the term. And then we think, oh, the, these secret societies must be very holy because they use the sun. And uh, there's, this, there's the, the rays of the sun. And there's the eye at the top of the pyramid. And what could that be? Could it be the eye of God, you know, or is it some Egyptian god or whatever? We've got to realize that, yeah, it's light, all right, but it's a specific kind of light, because light has some very damaging and very negative properties. And we go into this in the book, and we go into this on the website, because this is what Luciferian atonism really is. And people need to start finding out that light can blind and light can burn, and that light can also breed delusion and ignorance. There's things that we need to know about the metaphysical and physical principles of light and why secret societies would be using that and calling themselves the enlightened ones or the elites or the alumni. You see, there's all those sorts of questions. But the book in general does what no other volume in this world does and that it takes back all the secret society symbols that are constantly used. And anyone can look at these. The Freemason symbols, the, the Knights of Malta, the Sovereign Order of the Knights of Malta, uh, the... Um, the Knights Templar, for instance, you know, the Knights of St. John, the reason why the, the word even St. John is used a lot, um, the Freemasons, of course, the Priory, the Zion, all of the different secret societies that people are starting to now understand and, and learn about, use certain symbols that come out of Ireland and come out of Egypt, and now we can understand why. And we also can understand something very, very important. And that is, why is it that there's such tremendous allegiance from all of these people, even when it's clear that they're doing negative things towards humanity. This has been asked even by novices. They say, look, how can it be that the heads of the World Bank and all of these, you know, coteries and the heads of government and the heads of state and the heads of the think tanks and the secret societies and the governments of the world, why does nobody dissent? Why is there such 100% allegiance? And we know from the work of, um, uh, you know, the uh, Ted Gunderson and Jim Keith that, of course, on the lower level of the pyramid, they make sure that they compromise the politicians and leaders you know, sexually and stuff like that, so there's also, there's other reasons for the allegiance. But further up the pyramid, how come there's such tremendous allegiance from people who are rational men who should know better? Well, let me tell you why. Would you not also be an allegiance, and would your knee not bow if you have been indoctrinated to believe that the man or the being that you're serving is in fact the Christ, the Sun King, the Pharaoh? You better believe it. So when they move up beyond the 33rd degree, and all you got to do is look at a Masonic degree 
and are talking about these higher degree initiations, we find out what this royal secret really is, which is that these people believe, and I mean 100% believe, that they are serving a pharaoh, the emperor of the world, a Christed individual, or the descendants of this Christed individual. Of course, they have a, little, a lot different idea of what that means than, say, a Christian would think of Jesus Christ. They, it's, it's night and day between what they think. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I would think so. And also on that point, you know, I, I look at it, you know, when it, you know, you you talk about the light and everything. It's uh, it's amazing on how well, you know, these these people that are the thirty third degrees, et cetera, et cetera. When you're giving, when you're given, I should say, the knowledge that has been held secret from so many people for so many eons, and you know they're getting, they're not given at all. Obviously, I don't think anyone is. Um, but they are given parts of it. That in itself would be an opiate, I would think. It's, it's a tremendous opiate. Um, remember, as you say, a, a great deal of the people don't even need to know who they're serving. Merely the power, the, the wealth, and, the, and all the privilege is enough to keep most of the cronies in line. So, um, and of course, then of course we have the, the ones who are compromised, either politically or sexually. We know that, that is, that's happened. That's all been exposed. So there's, there's many, many factors that keep people, you know, in line. But I'm talking about the real... Because let's not make a mistake that the people who rule at the top are also very highly intelligent. And see, remember, we need to know this because we will never be able to understand their thinking. How, see, how can we inform the victim if the victim is not even empowered to fight his enemy? So in all of this, we have to understand what the enemy's agenda is, and we have to understand something about their thinking. It's just like the old generals used to have the picture of their of their general, the rival on their desks or on the wall. We know next to nothing about the kind of thinking process of our enemy. And if you don't know that, my goodness, you're shooting in the dark. So we, in all wars, especially in all conflicts, it is primarily an intellectual conflict. Let's get this clear. And that it, knowledge is the key component, the key weapon. Knowledge is the key weapon. So in my work, there's a very great desire to, you know, allow individuals to start getting a glimpse into the kind of thinking and the kind of agenda and the kind of mindset of the enemy. Otherwise, you just go, okay, enemy, and then like, you know, some sort of brute. You're running around the streets with a club trying to, you know, deal with the situation. It's impossible. You have to know your enemy. And these individuals, I believe, are 100% dedicated to what they do because they're finally initiated at the 33rd degree and above. They are initiated into something absolutely stunning that they're not prepared for, that they will not suspect. And of course, the bloodline families who reinitiate their new children into this, they have even less reason for you know wanting to go renegade is because they are absolutely believing that they are servants of the emperor of the world, semi-enlightened beings whose antiquity goes back to ancient Egypt, who have a bloodline that goes even further back to the time of Atlantis, that these beings are Christed, fully intellectually inspired, God-inspired individuals. This is what the situation was physically in Egypt. You only have to pick up a book on Egypt to read it. What the love of the Pharaoh, you see. They were people. gods. It's the same rubbish that they have today at Windsor Castle, Buckingham Palace. You watch them all dribbling and waving their flags. I mean, but multiply that, you know, many, many, many times. And then make that, uh, then transpose that allegiance in your mind to a secret society context in which knights, very powerful and wealthy leaders, mostly male, but obviously there are women, who have gone through an incredible gradual, you know, indoctrination of a fraternal type, of a fraternal kind, so that they're purged and cleansed, and they go through all of this stuff, to arrive at the end to realize that, my goodness, guess who has bestowed upon you your knighthood and your Templarhood and your role? Guess who you actually do serve? Let us now pull back the veil and introduce you to something amazing. It's not a book. All those Christians are running around the Bible, and these Muslims over here with their little book, you see? They're going, oh, no, 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 we're not... You're not serving any book, laddie. And you're not serving any old human, you know, flawed king. We're not going to pull back the veil and show you who the Windsors, the Habsburgs, you know, the uh, Hanoverans, we're going to show you who kings bow their knees from. 
in front of. Why is it that the top secret society motto is Per Me Regnus Regent, which means, through me, all kings will reign? Why hasn't everybody ever dealt with that in the conspiracy movement? Well, then who's this me? There it is glaring you in the face that you have a G in the center of the compass and rule. There you have it uh, in your face that the, the symbols look like a large capital A. <laughs> the pyramid itself is a capital A. There's a 14th removed two-dimensional eye at the top. You have known Illuminati uh, servants like Benjamin Franklin who go by the secret code name of Moses. You know, we have the Bacons of the world serving the Tudor dynasty who is the Tutors. It's all there for the eye to see, and yet, strangely, no eye has seen it. Well, speaking the, of I, Moses, um, wasn't I'm sorry, what in e ancient Egypt weren't some of the high priests referred to as a Moses? That's right, initiator. Moses was nothing more than a title, in exactly the same way that jo um, Jesus is a title, in exactly the same way as the word Christ is a title, or Joshua is a title, um, or Solomon is a title, or David. These things, like I've been saying on so many shows, these we have a uh, lie when certain names are, are titles and titles are changed into names. You know, there's a whole machination just with the words alone that's so befuddling to people. No wonder the truth hasn't come out. But most of the terms that you see in the Bible, like the Davids, David just meant a commander, a master, a, a certain degree, a degree of a, a Masonic organization that came out of Egypt. A Jew meant nothing more than the word judge does today. It was a sign of matriculation. A Jew was an enlightened one of a solar church. But Jew did not have anything to do with any race or any, or even any uh, ethnic background at all. A Jew was anyone who was an initiate of a solar church, of which there was many in Amarna, in Giza, and in Heliopolis especially. The whole of Egypt was covered in solar churches worshipping Ra originally, and then later, after the Akhenaten maniac came on the throne, he started to tweak it and changed it into the, work, the worship of... Uh, Aton, or Aten, from which we get the number 10. There's a reason why, you know, the government of England are from number 10. You just have to put a letter A on the beginning and you'll realize what door to what house they're dealing with there, the, why that number is used. Oh, yeah, number 10 Downing. Right, and isn't the Roman numeral for number 10 a big X? Yeah, exactly. How many commercials do you see that X on? How many movies do you see it on? How many insignias do you see it on? How many flags do you see it on? It's just a big number 10 in Roman numerals looking at you. Have a look, take a look now at the flags of the world, or go to my website, I'll show you, that the number 10 has been used as a symbol. Athens, Athens, Athena. Then the, just the, the research of one of these areas, once you know that you're dealing with secret societies and following their trail, as so many people have been doing, but then you'll realize why the solar lion is on Trafalgar Square. And the symbol of the lion, you see, is Vatican City. And lions are everywhere. Uh, like um, like on your website also, you have like uh, the Royal Arms of England, the, the Queen's personal emblem. It has a... And this is a question also I had for you. It has the Druidic uh, Bardic Harp as well as the Egyptian lions on it. Sure. Um, but what... I've always been curious about this on what does... Uh, the Bardic Harp, what does it symbolize? Because also it is on Guinness, it's their corporate logo, yeah. which is the number one selling beer in the world, so obviously that symbol is all over. Well, the Guinness clan are connected to the, um, oh, it's just slipped my mind now. They're very connected to, I think it's Cabot Lodge, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Guinness is just a code name that leads you off the track. The Guinness are not an Irish family at all. They live in Ireland, and they have a few, you know, descendants back living in Ireland. But they're originally Illuminati Tudor uh, people from the time of Cabot Lodge. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I may be mistaken, but I think it's the Cabot Lodge dynasty that they're connected to. Uh, but I just, I totally can't remember right now. But they're connected to a very powerful Illuminati group in England. It just happens that they set up shop in Ireland. And the harp that is used on all Irish stuff, of course, goes back to the old Druidic church. It's just a symbol of the ancient, ancient Druids that predated the Egypt, Egypt, the great mystery teachers of the Druids who knew about the music of the spheres. It's just a code symbol showing you that, you know, of, of, of the Irish, the Aria. Well, I just, I personally just thought it might have something to do with maybe vibration or something because, sure. you know, obviously music and... Oh, absolutely. What have you? It deals, with the, it deals with the frequency of the planets, because each of the strings of a harp used to be attuned to the Hertzian frequency of the planets in ancient times. Ah, interesting. That's something I did not know. I love talking to you, Michael. Learn 10,000 new things in a conversation. Oh, the, the story of the harp uh, is also very connected with underworld cycles. 
which of course you'd have to be in the secret societies or very much in the metaphysics and tarot and alchemy to understand this. And I hope everyone listening to us understands that when you're dealing with secret societies or if you're a member of the secret societies, you are very much a person who deals in rites and rituals. Uh, rites and rituals of the sun, rites and rituals, just like you said, the Bohemian Grove meeting is coming up on the summer solstice. And in their rites and rituals, and there's nothing negative about it, it's just it's been done for millions of years, there is, just like the rhythms and phases of human life and human organic birth and the biorhythms of the body, there are rites and rituals of passage. And one of the most important rites and rituals of passage, and by the way, you go through it even if you, you don't think you're going through it, is what's called the underworld cycle. So even if you're not into astrology and metaphysics, believe me, in your life you're still going to go up through this. It's just that people in secret societies understand this openly, and people behind religion understand this, that Christ's going into Harrow Hell, where he descends into the underworld. It's just like Orpheus, you see, and, and uh, Persephone. Persephone, exactly. They're going into the underworld. So this is also symbolized by the harp. The harp was one of the most ancient symbols of the underworld journey, in which, just like in the Chinese or the Hawaiian myths, when you have to dive deep under the ocean to get the pearl of great wisdom, so did the king of the of the Gales, Dagda, in this case, is coming to mind. Uh, there's been different renditions of the story. Has to go into the underworld to retrieve his harp that has been stolen. The harp, of course, represents his soul or the spirit, uh, the spirit of music, the muse, and so forth and so on. He has to actually go into the underworld and has to sing or call his harp which then jumps off the wall back into his hands. So when we're talking about the old famous Greek myth that people think is so terribly ancient, well, listen, that's baby stuff. To the, It came from the Celts thousands of years before that, when the Dagda had to go into the underworld to retrieve his harp. And so we have Orpheus in the Greek myth going down you know, to play to Eurydice and come out with his harp. These, the Greeks didn't invent anything that they didn't inherit from other groups like the Phoenicians and the... Uh, and the Celts, and we'll go into that in the book. But the most important revelation, I think, that is uh, topical, which is going to hopefully signify a major movement forward, uh, moving into a different gear of the conspiracy movement, is to realize once and for all we're all a secret society symbolism coming out of France, coming out of the Grand Orient Lodges, coming out of America. Graham Hancock's book, Talisman, for instance, is a huge volume that talks about you know the layouts of the of the of the cities of the world, especially America, and showing how much Egyptian symbolism was incorporated into, into Paris, France, and into London, and into New York. We have David Olveson, and in all cases, both in the case of Beauval and in Graham Hancock, and in the case of David Olveson, who wrote the Secret Ar Architecture of Our Nation's Capital, all three authors are humble enough to say we don't have a faintest idea why this stuff is being done. They beautifully pointed out as great researchers. But they clearly admit, we haven't a clue why this is done. We have no idea why Napoleon or any of these people or the King of England, you know, or George Washington or any of these people would have commissioned this kind of stuff to happen. We have the vague idea they were Freemasons, and basically that's it. They leave it hanging. So, you know, I've just basically, again, you, you'd be amazed how much of my work is born out of frustration with other people's work. I mean, let's not even get into that. I, I totally agree. Um, actually, um, we a little bit over our first hour, um, so if you want to take a little break... And uh, we'll get right back to things and uh, let everybody get their heads straight and get together. And uh, we'll return uh, just a few minutes. And uh, we'll continue on with uh, Michael Tessarian and we'll talk more uh, about symbolism and, of course, uh, the cult of Aten, or Aten, however you would like to put it. And uh, a very interesting topic, Michael. And again, I thank you so much for coming on here to the bunker tonight. So uh, we'll You're welcome. catch you back here in just a few. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the bunker here on RevereRadioNetwork.com. And as you know, I have a very special guest tonight. We have Mr. Michael Tessarian. And we're speaking about the cult of Aton. And uh, we've been speaking of symbols um, and Michael, I got a quick question for you. Um, the other week, I was watching the History Channel, and there was a program on obelisks. And it came to a point with the Vatican when they were erecting the obelisk in Vatican Square, which is a giant zodiac. They erected the obelisk in this, and what I noticed was there was a spider atop of the obelisk, not the very top, but very close to the top. And does that, what type of meaning do you know that that has, if any? Well, that's uh, interesting that you bring that up because the spider, I believe, 
is something that is a symbol that's been used by the ancient you know societies going all the way back even to the pre-diluvian age i mean in the nazca lines isn't there a huge symbol of a spider there there is actually yes right and then you know we have um the, at the hague which was where the eu was running from at one point i think uh this is an enormous black widow spider that's incorporated right there at the seat of, of european government um i don't know i think it connects to geometry there's a whole connection with the idea that the spider creates this elaborate web and so the web makers or the web casters you know the native american indians have a lot of uh, symbolism of that uh, that it's a keeper of wisdom the spider is a sort of a wisdom agent and also that it's a uh, it waits for its prey as opposed to hunting it. It lets the prey be caught by its own struggle. So the the spider could be an interesting symbol because, of course, when the spider captures any victim, in the same way that the Illuminati are capturing the, the souls of men, what happens is that the spider doesn't do anything. The soul, the fly, by being caught, its own struggles to be free is what further enslaves it. So there's some intricate double thinking here about you know the nature of the of the spider it's a very occult symbol in my mind i think it's also connected to the number eight which is itself the number eight connects to the sun and the sun cult so who knows maybe this is being used as a cryptic symbol for the those members of the sun cult uh what are the numbers as far as the the cult of Atan goes as far as you're concerned with that what 13. numbers are they using the number 13 the number 12 these are solar numbers um 12 and the one because before the Jesus Christ, before the Zodiac, you had the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel. When, and if people have followed my work, they'll really know what those 12 tribes were. It was the 12 tribes of the Levites who were sun worshippers in, in Egypt. They were not some lowly, you know, vagabond Jews. These were an enormous dynasty of people who worshipped the sun. And Aton is the 13th. So you have the 12 signs of the Zodiac and the sun itself is 13. So the number of Aton and the number of his servant is 12 and 13. Then uh, then you have solar numbers like the number 8. And the number 10 is also very, very important because Aten, Aton, the number, as we said, connects very strongly. Very interesting. Um, another point that you made on your website I found very interesting, and people should go check this out. I'll try to put a link up with the download so when people go to Revere and find it, um, they can link up straight to your place if they don't get it there. Um, but this is all on the Cult of Atone, and there's just so much information there, and this is just the beginning of your book that's coming out. And uh, it's uh, I found it just really amazing, especially uh, when it comes to the dollar bill and these symbols that are obvious, and a lot of people think that you know it's the Eye of Ra and etc. Um, what is your explanation on this of not being the Eye of Ra? Well, it's definitely not the Eye of Ra. This is a specific, that's, you know, the work... I really hope this gets infused into the people who have been studying this, because that eye is specifically the eye of Aton, Aton being Adonai, being Jehovah. So let's forget about Ra and Horus and Osiris and all of this nonsense. That is a specific symbol from a specific time, from a specific dynasty. It comes from Akhenaton. It is an Akhenaten symbol. Akhenaten was very attracted to the pyramid because it's like the capital letter A. There, the Egyptians had a capital letter A just like we did. The word Ake. If you take the word Ake Naton, it's made up of two syllables, Ake and Aton. Aton, we already understand, is the sun, and the sun is likened to the eye. But the very word Ake, which is the beginning uh, syllable of Akhenaten, actually means the eye. So Akhenaton meant the eye of Aton, or the eye of the sun. So the symbol that you see on the dollar bill, which shows literally exactly that, an eye at the top of 13 levels, is Ake Naton. That's what it is. And, and and also the most bizarre, uh, this is why, I, and what I'm going to tell you next is, is the reason why I cannot like, understand how this, no one else has ever discovered this. Because in Egypt, in Egyptian hieroglyphics, when they wanted to portray the word Ake, they, for some reason, they used the I, obviously, because I'm saying Ake meant the I, but the other symbol that the Egyptians used as a hieroglyphic to represent Ake, the word Ake was an eagle. Really? And what do you see on the other side of the dollar bill? The eagle. So the eagle with the 13 stars and the 13 leaves and the 13 berries and, and the 13 you know wings, the feathers of its wing, and the star of David above its head, for goodness sake, with 13 stars. And on the other side of the bill is, is the pyramid 
both these symbols are not just from Egypt, which is about as meaningless as you could ever say. They are they're actually, can you believe it, they are hologram, they are literally, they are insignias of the word Akhenaton. They actually mean that in hieroglyphics. The eagle and the, and the, the eye with the sun rays literally mean one personality out of Egypt and one only. It's so obvious. And the Rothschild dynasty, who are agents of the House of Hesse, because the House of Hesse, like the House of Orange, what, what isn't the sun orange? So the House of Orange and the House of Habsburg, these are descendants of this cult of Aton. Then the Rothschilds, who are then funded by the House of Hesse to continue opening the banks and doing what they're doing, what is their symbol above their door? Most scholars know that, that it was the same eagle, the same Manasseh, the tribe of Manasseh, but that's also a little bit of a ruse to lead you away from the who the star and the eye is really relating to. Like Jesus was called the Lion of Judea. But the original Lion of Judea, a man who was always shown in the position of the Lion, was Akhenaten. His most famous, favorite symbol was the Lion. Freemasons, if you go onto my website, you'll see that Freemasons, uh, when their t a photograph or a picture was taken of the Freemasons, especially people like Albert Pike, I have a picture of Albert Pike, their left hand, which always represents the left hand path, would always be clenched in a very specific way. I mean, it looks very innocuous if you see a photograph until you know what you're looking for. Like MGM, using the lion. Trafalgar Square, using the lion. And then these pictures of Albert Pike and the Freema Freemasons holding their hand in what is called the lion's paw. It looks like you're clenching a fist, but it's not quite. It's definitely not a fist. It's like that picture, uh, I'm sure a lot of my listeners have seen it, of Pat Robertson with his fist. Yes. And it was this like is, off the of Time George magazine, Bush I has used it. George Bush has used it, standing right on CIA headquarters with his arms crossed like the skull and bones, but his hands are clamped in a certain way. That is called the lion's paw. It's a well-known Freemasonic symbol. And uh, uh, this, this is also... Uh, what's the oldest reference to the lion, you see? Because the original lion of Judea, the one that they're talking about, the lion of the Jews, is not Jesus, it's not Joshua, it's Moses. But who is Moses? Like Sigmund Freud showed in his last book, but nobody paid any attention, Moses is Akhenaten, always was, always will be. One of the Moses. Moses just means son of, or one drawn from the waters, the initiator. It's a cover term to hide the fact that there was a pharaoh who was so evil that he was thrown out of Egypt, and the people that went with him were the sun cult, 12 tribes, not of Jews, at least as we know that term today, because that term has also been hijacked by people who have no use for it, and are not real Jews. The, the, the word Jew represented an elite a sun worshipper, a person who was an, a priest of the of the temples of the sun in Egypt. All of them were worshippers with Akhenaten. They all were like a coterie, you see, just like a president has his cabinet. And all of these people made the mistake of following this renegade so that when Horam Heb and Sethi I and Ramesses I and Ramesses II, when these four pharaohs of the 19th dynasty came on the throne, took the throne for themselves to deal with this renegade, when they ousted Akhenaten, Moses, and his whole coterie, they also ousted, they also expelled all of these sun cult guys that had been plaguing Egypt for hundreds and hundreds of years. They got rid of them. And they wanted nothing more to do with this. They wanted to go back to the old worship of Amun-Ra, you see, a more ancient and more authentic kind of sun worship that wasn't so uh, racist, super racist. Now, isn't it interesting that the Levites, by their own definition, lived in a city uh, first of all, the Jews are very hesitant to even talk about any of their time in Egypt. They're very unspecific. Like, for instance, the Old Testament does not mention the Pharaoh uh, that it was meant to be at the captivity. You'd, you'd wonder why that was. They mention the, the most minute individuals, but they don't mention the Pharaoh himself that was at the time of the Exodus. Then we, we are on our alert that there's something very bizarre here by omission. But anyway, it turns out that the Levites has been discovered, is admitted in the, in the holy books of, of the Jews, they lived in the city of Avaris, A-V-A-R-I-S, Avaris. But Avaris's other name was Zion, spelled Z-I-O-N or Z-A-O-N, Zion or Zion. So when we're hearing about modern Zionists and the Prairie de Sion, you see, we understand that there's an Egyptian connection again. So the, the incredible um, connections of these in, the original Levites, the original cult of Aton. So when you're hearing about Lion of Judea, when you hear that word Judea in the first place, when you're hearing about the house of Judah, 
and the house of David, the house of the Davids, the Dovids. Who were, the Davids were always symbolized, they had a couple of symbols, and the, one of the most important ones was the Dove, Dovid, which is used by the Knights of Columbus, which people can see the Dove is on Greenpeace, it's on the um, symbol of uh, the, the royal standards of, of the Queen of England. It's upside and, down on the brainwashing network. Yeah, and isn't it uh, on the T TBN? Well, yeah, that's what I call the brainwashing yeah. network, TBN. Yeah. And they also use a Celtic cross, no doubt. No <laughs> and they also, don't they have like a unicorn and a... Uh, yeah, the a unicorn is the symbol of the Levites, and the lion is the symbol of the royal houses of Judea, okay. proving uh, houses of Aton. So the next time you see the royal standards of England, the next time anybody looks at a flag or insignia and sees a famous lion and the unicorn, and the symbol is everywhere... Just let it be known that the lion represents the pharaohs, the sun kings of, of Egypt, and the unicorn that is an alliance. Anyone in this wide world with half a brain cell would go, what on earth is this symbol used? I mean, it, does it mean anything? Why would the kings of the world, the highest royal families of the world, be using this most bizarre symbol of a horse, a white unicorn, and a lion? Tell me. What, uh, explain. Somebody who you think in the world, coming just from even a regular school, must have asked this question. No, nobody asked the question. The few people that study symbolism, it's amazing. There's so few people in the world that you know, even question this stuff. Well, the fact of the matter is that the white, pale unicorn represents the moon, because it's white and it's pale. And the, ready, the red lion always represented the sun. When you turn it into secret society symbolism, it means the sun is a symbol of the royal house of Aton, Akhenaten, the kings of Egypt, and his servants are the white horse the Levites, because the moon is slightly subservient, you see, it's the reflector of the sunlight. The unicorn is the subservient one to the lion, so they, they're both in connection with each other. They're what both the, of, of, of similar rank. What would the dragon have to symbolize then? Same thing, the dragon is... Is the lion? Or, no, the dragon is even more ancient, because the people that we're talking about in Egypt, if you really want to go back, why do you think I did my Atlantis book before I, do, I did this book on Egypt? Is because of the dragon. The idea is that the, the royal dynasties that we're talking about that set themselves up in Egypt and subsequently have, have been controlling with their new world order, the West, the, you know, the modern times, are, are themselves blood related to the old Atlantean Nephilim and fallen angels that are best known as the serpent people or the dragon bloodline or uh, is also called the Brotherhood of the Snake by the great author William Bramley. So if we go back before Egypt, which we now can do, and my work has already done this, then we're into the dragon thing. Then we're into the serpent thing, because Akhenaten and most of the other houses of Egypt, by the way, not just him, in this instance, we're talking about even the Hyksos dynasties of the 13th dynasty of Egypt, and perhaps even uh, way back to the 3rd dynasty of Egypt, with uh, Ankos Khonsu, who had a dragon court, uh, back into the old Irish. You see, that's why you have the symbols of uh, Wales and Scotland still have the old dragons on them. Oh, yeah, all through London there's dragons everywhere, in right. old London especially. So when you see the dragon, it's, it's really a sign saying the bloodline. It's, it's a, it's a non-specific... Just like the red carpet then? Pardon? It's like the red carpet then? The, oh, you broke up there. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, symbolizing like the red carpet? Yes, the red, the red thread, the red carpet. It's an overarching symbol that just reminds the world uh, don't think this is a new thing. This comes out of the ancient times. It, it used to be called the Dragon Bloodline uh, by Lawrence Gardner. It's called the Brotherhood of the Snake. You know, one can use all sorts of terms. It's just a lineage because they always saw it as a genetic lineage, and therefore the genes look like the, you know, the twisting serpent, the coiling serpent down from ancient times. And therefore one can never underestimate the symbol of the dragon. But the dragon is less of a specific symbol because it just represents the, the ancient power. The dragon just represents ancient power coming down from many ages and aeons ago. But the symbols that we're dealing with, the turn up in, in Freemasonic enclaves, is very specific. Yes, it's Egyptian, but it's a lot more specific than that. It's not the symbolism of Seti I or Meram Ta. It's not the symbol, it's not the, uh, you see, the symbolism of the, of the pharaohs of the 12th dynasty, or the 13th, or the 15th, or the 17th. No, it's the very specific symbolism of the 18th dynasty, concocted by the Israelite pharaohs of Egypt, that Mustafa Gadala and Ahmed Osman, and Ralph Ellis, and other great authors now are starting to expose, that what the Jews have, the biggest secret that they've wanted to keep hidden from so long, and actually they've been very successful, is that there actually was, there were pharaohs in Egypt, not vagabonds, 
wandering in Canaan and then suddenly, uh, bizarrely, one day just turning up at the steps of the, uh, the house of the Pharaoh and going, hey, let me in and then promote me so that I'm the richest, richest man in the world in five minutes. No, Joseph was the richest man in Egypt. He was the richest man in the world. How can that happen? That some wandering guy who fell down a pit suddenly next minute has become the mayor, he's the vizier, he's the keeper of the granaries and turns out to be the richest man in Egypt, the second only to the Pharaoh. And we're meant to believe this. Nothing could be more ridiculous. That all, the, all the other dignitaries and all the other bloodline descendants of the houses of Egypt, but this wandering vagabond ends up in five minutes. He's, he's, he's second only to the Pharaoh, and we believe this stuff? This passes for Bible study? What nonsense? <laughs> I completely agree. I, I couldn't agree more with that, actually. I mean, it, it's it's great that you look at it that way because it's a realistic way of looking at it. How is history going to be written about a vagabond? Well, listen, Abraham, Abraham, that it be known, is in the same boat. He was no wanderer from Canaan. He was the first first pharaoh of the 13th dynasty. They arrived as a, as a uh, horde called the Hyksos people, who were called the Shepherd Kings. They were bloodthirsty, uh, very Luciferian, dark, rebe rebellious, and extremely bloodthirsty. Hated in, from the moment that they arrived in Egypt to the end. And the first pharaoh was called Abram. I mean, there it is in black and white. Abram. Ab meaning father. Ra, Ram meaning Ra. Because they were worshippers of the sun, like so many people are in those ancient lands. Now, Abraham means my father Ra, or I am under my father Ra. Abraham just means, is a man calling himself, I'm under my father Ra. Simple as that. The first pharaoh of the, of the 12th dynasty of Hyksos people, that a great, heavily funded, age-old uh, funding has gone into making sure that we know next to nothing about these Hyksos pharaohs. There's been so many lies told about them, you wouldn't believe it. The other famous word that represents the Hyksos dynasty that infiltrated into Egypt and dominated under the sword, by the way, the Hyksos was called Apiru, A-P-I-R-U. And Apiru simply meant wanderer, vagabond, leper, uh, invader, you see, um, ne'er-do-well. It was, it, was it was a term of slander that the Egyptians used for those who invaded their country and put their people to the sword was Aperu, a non-desirable, an illegal immigrant. Later on, when the history of what we're talking about was being tweaked so that it would be hidden by the, the, the colleges and the Vatican, they, they turned the word Aperu into, uh, into a similar word called Ibaru, which was a meaning high priest in Egypt of the sun. So along came these false uh, scholars and tried to make the word Aperu, which were related to these Israelite uh, invaders, and they, they made it appear that this was the word Ibaru, which is completely different. So the Ibaru, or if you put the H on, it becomes the Habaru, or the Hebrew. They made this word that was known in Egypt and simply meant, again, high priest of the sun cults, the high initiates of the mysteries of the world, of the universe. They're trying to tell you that that's the same word as these vagabonds, and they succeeded. So they, they crossed over words, they muddled history so that we'd be completely confused. So, you know, when you're dealing with ancient Egypt, we are dealing now with a, an incredible story about these ancient so-called Israelite uh, pharaonic dynasties and this cover-up that came later in the, after the rise of Judeo-Christianity when, when these religions were being codified in the West, in Rome especially, and also in, in Jerusalem and in Babylon, where the whole story had to be hidden because they, they did not want the Egyptian connections to be known. It was fundamental after they had been ousted and kicked out of, of uh, Egypt that from then on Egypt would be taboo and that no reference to Egypt and the fact that they actually were ruling in Egypt and were millionaires in Egypt because then they'd have to, uh, then they'd have to tell history, well then how come you guys got kicked out? You must have done something pretty rotten to be booted out. So then they, they with, one, with one hand, of course, they would have loved to let the world know that they were Egyptian. But you see, unfortunately the other side said, well, we can't, because then of course we, we start out in history as renegades. So we have to make a decision. And therefore we have to darn play. And that's where the cult of the ten tribes of Israel, the twelve tribes of Israel, and the fact that they were slaves in Egypt, and that Abraham was a wanderer, you see? And all these lies were concocted. Lies which are so unsustainable that even the modern archaeologists are having a problem even discovering these places in Canaan, called Jerusalem and so-called, you know, lands out there. They don't even exist. But it didn't matter. 
what mattered was that Egypt had to be taboo, the connections between the Israelite people and the temple of Saul Amon, Saul Amon, the Heliopolitan, Heliopolitan temples had to be hidden. And they did a beautiful job. The Bible is nothing more than in the uh, concoction edited later by Bacon and these other people to make absolutely sure that until our age, until the work of Mustafa Gadala and Ahmed Osman and Ralph Ellis, that these, and these are people who've written only in the last 15 years, we are in a special time, like we said at the beginning of this show, where the, we, we're no longer laboring under the great age-old you know, questions about the dramatis persona of the Bible and the characters of the Bible. It's been revealed. It's been revealed who Jesus was. It's been revealed that there was a bloodline of Akhenaten that after he perished at Mount Sinai, then you know, his, the next, thing, next in line of the cult of Aton, now that the cult of Aton was expurged from Egypt, they had several commanders, and those commanders were known as Davids. That's why the Queen of England says, I rule in place of David. David I'm that? of the seed of David. I rule, I rule on this throne for the Christ for the seed of David. Why would she be saying that? That's amazing information, because exa you're so right on that, and she does say that. Why is there a star of David above the American eagle? Why are what on earth are these symbols? That are, wait, what is Camp David? Not only, not only the star of David up above the American eagle on the dollar bill, but did you know it's also on every seat in Congress? Yes, I did know that. And and exactly, the Congress, These things, look at the Egyptian symbols that are all around the state capitals and buildings. We... What we're dealing with here is, it has rightly been said that Vatican controlled America well, through, the, the, through like the Black the, Pope. The but Masonic the black behind behind the Black Pope. See, it's like this: they know that Vatican is is controlled by the White Pope. Fortunately, now with the work of the great scholars, it's coming out that there is a Black Pope operating in the world. For, you know, the Jesuit Pope. We, we, this is fantastic research has come out. We need to go one step further and realize that behind the black pope is the, is the sun cult of, of Aton. Period. And we know this, one of the reasons why we know this, is because the general, the, uh, sorry, the Jesuit leader, the black pope, calls himself, one of his other titles is the general. Did you know that Akhenaten's favorite term for himself was the general? That's nice, isn't it? <laughs> Did not the Bourbon king, Louis the Sixteenth, refer to himself as the sun king? Where do these terms come from? They're Egyptian. The whole of Paris is aligned to Egypt, filled with Egyptian symbolism. And we would wonder why. So hopefully now the message will get out that we're, we're now, the veils are being pulled down. There's a reason why the Knights of St. John, the Knights of Malta, are using the symbol of the pyramid seen from above, because the Knights of Malta cross, if somebody even hand draws a Knights of Malta cross on a paper, or looks at one, you can go to my website, the Astro Theology pages, and look at the Knights of Malta cross. It's nothing more than, as Jordan Maxwell has said so many times, is a pyramid seen from above. So the Knights of Malta cross is a pyramid. Ergo, the Knights of Malta are Egyptian. And there's not a single symbol to be found in, in all the secret societies of the world that is not either Egyptian, and if it's not Egyptian, it's, it's uh, Irish. Now, people have come in and said, oh, no, 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 it's Judaic. Well, let's then explain that. If you're saying it's Judaic, you are saying it's Egyptian. Because it has now been exposed that the dramatis persona of the Bible, including the twelve famous tribes of Israel, Isis, Ra, and El, are the tribes of the sun cults of Egypt. Because what I forgot to say is this, that when these Hyksos people invaded Egypt for 300 years, they came in at the 12th dynasty and they ruled up until about the beginning of the uh, 18th, when the, uh, they were finally uh, expurged. When they invaded Egypt, they invaded northern Egypt. They came from the south, but they invaded the Delta region. What's in the Delta? Giza, Amarna, and Heliopolis. So all these Levitical, the Levites, the is what we are calling the Israelite pharaohs of Egypt, dominated in the Heliopolis, the, in the area of Heliopolis, the Sun Temples. So there, uh, the, the Sun Temples of Egypt were dominated by people that today are using the term the Jews. The Jew, uh, Judite literally meant those who, are, who worship the sun. So this has also been covered up. That when we're talking about the sun cult, or the solar cult, we're talking about temples that were top-heavy with these kinds of Levitical people that later on are claiming, that the Jews are claiming that are, are their forefathers. So when Akhenaten, who was their leader, because it was these sun cult priests who had the real power in Egypt, by the way, the pharaoh was basically... Uh, appointed by the priests of the temples of the sun, so let's make that clear. It wasn't the it wasn't the uh, pharaoh putting any of these priests in power. It was the priests putting the pharaoh in power. So the priests of the of the temples of Heliopolis 
were the ones who favored Akhenaten to come to the throne. They basically put him on the throne. Also, his mother was very powerful. In fact, you could, we could have five shows on just the power of his mother. Queen Tai is the reason for all of these things we're going into. People can see the whole story on the website. So they appoint Akhenaten, but finally, after the, desp the despotism of the sun priests and Akhenaten, Egypt rose up, and with a new pharaoh, they threw him out. So with him goes all of these Levitical sun priests, that's why you have a golden calf being created at the, at the foot of Mount Sinai. Does anybody question that that is also an Egyptian symbol of the sign of Taurus and would be typical that you would expect from Egyptians? I mean, there's so many symbols. So these individuals who then are cast out of Egypt are extremely royal. That's why in the Bible it says that Moses put up the brazen standard, the serpent standard. Why would he do that? Because that's the famous symbol of the pharaohs that he erected in the desert at the tabernacle. It's been revealed by Jordan Maxwell that the Ark of the Covenant that they were all uh, running around is an Egyptian symbol. It predates the Jews by thousands upon thousands of years. So if there wasn't enough Egyptian symbolism to tell us, and if these people were meant to be slaves that had an exodus, then how come they had enough gold in the first place to build a golden cap when they got to Sinai? <laughs> That's a really good point. <laughs> how come they left with all this oxen and camels and go-karts and, and all of this... Uh, all of these animals wait a minute I thought slaves are slaves I mean in my book a slave is a slave he, he's barely got the shoes on his feet yet even in the great movies they're happy to show you that these people had horses and mules and camels and, and oxen well listen in anybody's language in an agricultural culture that's wealth extreme wealth I mean you look at anywhere in South America or Africa you have land or if you have cattle right that but you know why money. Cecil B. DeMille chose to go and show that it's because Cecil B. DeMille knew what all the chumps who watch his movie don't know. He knew the true story, that these were Egyptian pharaohs. And if you watch the movie carefully, you'll see the symbolism of that. He knew what the Jewish elite know. That it's not Judaism, the religion that's been put there in front of these poor people who are being equally mind-controlled, just like Christians and Arabs are. He knew who the real Jew is are. That, that's a secret society term, a Freemasonic term relating to the solar cults of Egypt. That's why he, he was, uh, had the insider smile when he made that movie and said people won't even realize what they're watching here. So how can these guys get to Mount Sinai and suddenly have all this gold and then be saying in the history books that there were slaves in Egypt? No, there were no such slaves. And that's been even shot to pieces by even the greatest Jewish scholars from within Judaism have already shown that that's a preposterous lie. Then we need to go one step further and believe like Sigmund Freud believed and had labored to expose that this was a pharaonic dynasty and that Abraham and Sarah's son, Isaac, wasn't born from Abraham because Abraham, as we said, was a pharaoh in Egypt and his wife, Sarah, married with the king of southern Egypt. It turns out that the Hyksos people, after they had moved into Egypt in the early stages, there was a tremendous drought. And they needed to have grain from the king, the pharaoh. Egypt was split at that time into the famous Upper and Lower Egypt. And so Abraham, Abram, the Hyksos king, the Hyksos pharaoh, not the Abraham that's been put in front of people, he and his, and his coterie had to make contact with their enemy, their rival pharaoh, in southern Egypt to get the grain that was needed for their people to survive. The pharaoh of the, of the southern kingdoms did give them grain, but in the meantime fell in love with, or married with, Sarah, the very word means princess in Hebrew. <laughs> in the Quran it says, and in the Bible it says, Sarah was the, was the daughter of princes. So here's the trick. The pharaoh of the southern um, Egypt was thought Moses III, if I'm not mistaken. And he is the person who married Abram's wife, Sarah. Therefore, Isaac, the father of the twelve tribes of Israel is not born from Abraham, he's born from a pharaoh of Egypt. And this has been the thing that has been tried to be hidden for so long, that Isaac, who later is Israel, right, who gives birth to Israel, this individual that is so important to all the Jews, who is literally the founder and the father of the twelve tribes of Israel, is actually his father was not Abraham, has been put before us falsely by those who concocted the, the Jewish history but was actually the son of the great pharaoh of Egypt. That would make a lot more sense. Yeah. It would now make this, a hell of a lot more sense. This 
Just exactly. And this is this explains then why the tribes even divided themselves into the number twelve, which was a famous, anciently known, known all over the world as a sign of the number of the zodiac. <laughs> why would they even do that? Why would they even have the names? You see, the whole thing is Egyptian symbolism from beginning to end. As you said earlier, the Bible is filled with aphorisms that are legends, mysterious tales. All are now been exposed to the work of Jordan Maxwell and others, clearly showing you that these are Egyptian in origin. The Psalms of Solomon are connected to the uh, famous uh, Egyptian. You see hymns from the earliest time, from the time of uh, the uh, architect Imhotep. The earliest r romantic writings, the earliest poems of any kind, are noted from Imhotep. The closest parallels to those are the famous songs of Solomon in the Bible, right? There's a direct connection. The Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai are connected directly to the 42 negative confessions of the Egyptians, all been proven beyond shadow of a doubt. Then the secret society symbolism, which I come back to again and again and again, because this is classic proof. Classic proof. Not, not just the other idioms, you see, but the symbol of the eagle, the symbol of the eye. These are Egyptian hieroglyphic symbols, hierograms, all that are used by Jews, that are uh, familiar to Jewish people, but the, what the Jews have to realize is that they've also been sold a bill of goods. They've also been sold a lie. And, and one of the lies that we need to understand is this. If it is conceded by Jewish historians that there was 12 tribes of Israel, but only two of those remained loyal to the temple of Jerusalem, and ten assimilated into the western lands and are so-called the lost tribes because they absolutely assimilated with all the Gentiles into the western lands then how come it is that in 1948 the Zionist movement who, are, who claim to be descended from the two tribes of Judah why do they set up a state called the State of Israel <laughs> when they have no call to that term at all? Nor that uh, land actually because the same people that call themselves Jews are, there is no genetic Jew as far as I have seen Right, but here's um, the that's exactly correct. But no yet Jew can take himself racially or ethnically back to the Jews of the Holy Land. But look how preposterous it is. In their own works, they tell you that they that the ancient forefathers, whether there's a legitimate connection or not, let's just just for a moment accept that they are connected. Then they're telling you that those ten tribes are assimilated into the West. Well, there's no question about that. That's official Jewish history. Well, then tell me then how could it possibly be that two to three thousand years later, the Zionist movement called their own homeland the State of Israel, when it's a term that has no meaning within their own, uh, own, own uh, coterie. There must be a reason for it, and the reason for it is because they know what everyone else doesn't know. They know that the, what the word Israel really means. They know that Zion was originally a city in which the Levite pharaohs lived, they know that Israel is nothing more than the meaning of a solar cult of Egypt. It has got no racial, no religious connotation on it at all outside what I've just said. So of course they can call it the state of Israel, and they do it rightly so. But when the Jewish person thinks, oh, they mean the Israelites, as has officially been put in front of us, that's a complete and utter bogus. So we, we have a double thing here. We have a, a division in philosophy and ideology and understanding. These are individuals using terms as they understand them from within the walls of the secret societies. And we're out in the marketplace with a completely different reading of the same terms. And this problem has gone on down through the ages. And anyone who's written a book or done something to, you know, show this fact, they've had their books suppressed. Anyone like Jordan or anyone who's researched this, who's tried to point these facts out and to show the original connections of the etymology, has had their work suppressed. We are now in the age of the internet. We're now in the age of the DVD, the discs. So finally we can get this information out where it cannot so easily be suppressed. So that the world can have the great secrets that have been held back from it for so long. There's a tremendous story that enhances the Bible. It may contradict certain aspects of the Bible and certain aspects that we've come to understand of religion. But you know something? It gives a greater, deeper insight into the world of the, of the past into the world of religion and the world in which we've come. We deserve to make sense of the stuff that's been put in front of us now. Congratulations, we've come so far to know that mostly what we're being told is not true. Well, that's a great thrill. Fantastic. Wonderful. Let's everybody, you know, have a celebration and uh, awards can be given. The, the mankind has finally, in the 21st century, pretty much, not, uh, not all mankind, of course, sadly, but a great contingent of mankind has finally got to understand that I don't think we're being given the whole truth about the Bible, and probably we're not being told the truth about history. Marvelous. 
but now could we possibly put down the champagne glasses and go one little step forward to say, okay, then what is the true story? This is what is important. We, we congratulate ourselves that we can say we have the healthy doubt to realize we've been sold a pack of lies. But that's only 50% of the journey. Now we've got to say, well then, what is the truth? So mankind is now getting this uh, chance in the 21st century with the tools that are at hand and with the passion that he has inside himself to say, I understand I don't know, now tell me the truth. Tell me what these symbols are all about. And I don't care if it's a Christian telling me or a Jew or a Muslim or an Outer Mongolian or it's Michael Fasarian from Belfast. Look, I'm not concerned anymore with... I, I, I understand truth and I don't care to whom I have to turn for that because I am no longer going to play by those stupid checkerboards on the, on the board that has been made for me by my masters who are leading me to the altar of sacrifice. I am hungry after truth and I'll take a piece from here and I'll take a piece from there. I'll take a piece from Stan Monteith a brilliant man who walks this talk. He's Christian. Or from Tex Mars. Or from James Gardner. Or from Ralph Epperson. All are Christian. And then I'll go to David Icke. You know, and then I'll go to the, the Black Islam movement, Louis Farrakhan. He's got interesting information. Let me see what I can do with that. And then I'll go to the, the, the Jews against Zionism who are saying, my God, what have we been doing? Why are we following these murderers that have no place in Judaism. That's very much so on the East Coast, and I enjoy listening to a lot of those uh, gentlemen on the East Coast Absolutely. that are These very are, much so aware. There are so many rabbis, there's so many websites, you know, there's so many Jewish magazines that the rabbis have gone blue in the face, warning their people have nothing to do with this concoction, the state of Israel, that it wasn't even funded by a single Jewish person. The Jews didn't even know about it, didn't even, hadn't even heard of the concept until Lord Solmes, Lord Palmerston, and Balfour, the British elite, yeah, the real Zionists, the real Jew is the Jews, not religious Jews worshipping the Torah. That's a uh, hijacked term. They probably should come up with a different term because the Jew is the Jews, as is truly known, that's that term, are the royal dynasties that funded Herzl and the Zionist movement, knowing full well what they were doing. These are descendants of the cult of Aton, not Judaism, and they really know who the Jews are. So, we have a tremendous uh, lie that's been perpetrated on our world. And these royal families, through Benjamin Franklin, you see, and the other duplicitous founding fathers, who were nothing but Freemasons, but who knew how to play the gig to make it look on paper that there was a rebellion, because people would be suspicious. People were dead suspicious in those days. You'd be amazed how turned on people were who came to this country as immigrants who knew about the old world order and how rotten and corrupt it was, and who came to this country suspecting that, in fact, America could easily be run by the same hidden hand. And it wasn't very difficult to prove that that was in fact the case. Because who was here in the origins of America? The Hudson Bay Company, run from London. A tentacle of the East India Company. Of which the exact same British royal families down in Old Holborn, I mean you can just go into London and, and go to the, you know, the uh, offices there of the British government and see the records that America was owned every square inch the Native American Indians were massacred and America was owned by a group known as the Hudson Bay Company didn't it also eight, become the Virginia Company? Brown. wasn't Pardon? it also known as the Virginia Company? same thing Yeah. Virginia. these are all wings of the same group they're all out of Hanover they're all out of uh, Venice and then London now that group is known to themselves as the Russell Trust Lord Russell was there and one of the Lord Russells was at the famine, the great famine of Ireland. Guess who was uh, presiding over that? Was it Russell? These Russells have been around a long time. The Russell Trust is also known as the Skull and Bones Society. These are just terms for the same group, because it was the Russells and the Taft that set up the, you know, in Yale, in the, con in the context of Yale University, it's called the Skull and Bones Society. But the Skull and Bones Society outside of Yale is known as the Russell Trust. The Russell Trust is nothing more than the Hudson Bay Company that owned America, who is a hook, line, and sinker. So any talk of a free constitution and liberty for all is a pure ruse to get highly suspicious European people who knew a little bit of this to say, oh, no, 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 America's independent. America's going to be free. Don't worry. It's going to be completely... In fact, you're even going to fight the king. You're going to fight the king of England. And, you know, he's going to lose. And you're going to tell me that the king of England, King George with the mercenaries of the whole of Europe, the most powerful, the richest man in the world, is actually going to... <laughs> let me get my mind around this. He's actually going to lose to a bunch of buckskin-wearing Americans 
This is the people who's massacred half the planet, who has, who has got a colony in every remote region of the world. The only empire that's never been defeated as of yet. That's right. The, the sun never sinks on the British Empire. But 3% of these Americans, uh, well-meaning as they are, and, and don't, don't get me wrong, there was a rebellion, there was a fight after the gig is set up, after the board game is set up, and of course the pieces do their, go through their moves, don't they? Just as they do today in Iraq, all the soldiers over there having the faintest idea that the whole thing terrorism. is a ritual death. Has any soldier ever understood that? Well, it's the same thing with the so-called war of independence. It was not a war of independence. It was a fake war of independence to make it absolutely sure that as far as anyone was officially aware, on paper, this country was in rebellion and was, it was independent from England. Obviously, five minutes research tells you that that is not true, because if that was in fact the case, then there wouldn't have been within a hundred years the Federal Reserve setting itself up so easily. There was private banks all over this country from day one. The next thing you know, they split your country down the middle and you're having a civil war, which is exactly the sign of Freemasonic action in this country. How can people tell me this is a war of independence one minute, and then you have a civil war the next minute, which is the very same divisive principles, funded from the Grand Orient Lodge of France, one side, and Br Br London uh, funding the other. Oh my God, these guys are like yawning. They're dancing on their desks of how easy it is. And then they give you this glowing document, manufactured camera, camera obscura behind closed doors in Philadelphia. The terms alone tell you what the hell is going on. They manufacture this doctrine, which is so pathetic that most of the, the states actually turned down the Constitution. You had to have the Bill of Rights to even make it palatable for people. But then America, of course, took it, accepted it, and then 13 original states tells you everything, the number 13 again, being atonist in nature. They're literally marking it down, putting their signature on it for people to know that there's not, not even a shred of independence. You've got Freemasons at the highest levels of American government, making sure that the game will go according to plan. And you have basically agricultural, illiterate Americans, originally, buying into this, not knowing any better, hoping in their heart of hearts that it truly is under God and a free and independent country, which it never was. The Hudson Bay Company and the, the Russell Trust owned every square inch of land. And their partners are the Vatican and the Bank of Belgium, and the whole nine yards. All, all of our books and work goes into this. We can provide you any, any of your listeners with the evidence of this. It all goes back to the same families. Sure it does. Virginia. George, I was sitting with Jordan Maxwell just about a week ago at ConspiracyCon. And we went out to breakfast, and of course, uh, here he go. Jordan immediately says, "Why is it that Virginia is right next door to Maryland? Virgin, Mary, next door is Maryland. Wonderful, Ball, yeah. Uh, Baltimore, Ball is Bell, the great, you know, the ancient god of, of Egypt, Bell. The whole thing is the Masonic. Liberty Bell. The whole thing is Egyptian. The whole thing is British government. Because believe me, if this place was independent, then you would have had the greenbacks." You would have had your money here that was completely debt-free, and there would have never been in a thousand years a private federal bank even approaching these shores. Could not happen if this place was independent, period. You would have, you would have had no slavery. You would have a totally sovereign country. You don't have that because, believe me, I mean, I don't, I, I'm really sure, I'm really sure that there's not a person listening to your show that is ignorant enough to believe that in a mere space of just 200 years, that this country could be as fantastic as it created, and in a mere 200 years could be in the, in the horror state that it's in now, or not to even come up further to date. Uh, surely no one is, is dumb enough to think that 50 years ago America was the richest country in the world, and then in a mere 50 years it is now one of the greater debtor nations, if not the greatest debtor nation on earth. That that can happen just because American people made a flub one day and got it all wrong. No way. It's because you have a virus in your system that has always been there from the inception, that has been working for the destruction of, of consciousness and mankind and, you know, the world. America is no different. They were not going to lay on ships, and they were not going to have you come through into this country and really have things to be free. That doesn't happen. The Statue of Liberty was the first thing people saw, because that's not the Statue of Liberty. That's the Statue of your slavery, an Egyptian, Babylonian symbol showing you the Freemasons rule here sitting on a huge geomantic, geometric star just to let you know that when you come through the island of the Elves the Ellis that you can you may not be told this verbally but you're going to be stamped 
indexed, filed, and you're going to be a uh, debtor on the on the stock exchange of the United States of America. Get any idea of freedom? We'll allow you a certain amount of freedom because we know that you're going to need that for the experiment to work. So go mad, run amok, kill a bunch of Indians, murder and butcher yourselves for about 50 years or so. And we've got a lot of things to arrange while you're doing that anyway. So keep busy murdering and, and whoring and running amok because we, we're busy and we'll come back to you in about 100 years and then we'll show you that the big brother's back and we'll you know, slap down the gavel and we'll have courts and we'll have the World Bank and we'll have the Federal Reserve and we'll have a couple of uh, artificial depressions just to make sure that you, the money that you've made you're going to lose just to keep you in line and we'll have a couple of our European funded and born and bred Roosevelt's you see and we'll put a bunch of those liars and we'll bring over our dialectic and have you think that there's a two-party system. And we'll bring over our lying, false presidents to lie your children into foreign wars with your allies. That You should be allies with Russia. But we're going to embroil you in wars. We're going to even fund and create the worst kinds of tyrants, the Bolsheviks and other maniacs, to go over to, to foment you know, chaos in Europe. Yeah, this is American history. We're all funding China. I mean, same thing. <laughs> Japan has been America Incorporated from day one. I mean, there's no Japan. Uh, Japan ceased yeah. to exist the day that the atom bombs were dropped. They had no economy. Anything that Japan has got is American. So don't tell me, you know, that these people who don't know any better have never studied a day's homework, thinking that oh, let's stop Japanese products coming into America. <laughs> what kind of nonsense is that? All of that stuff was created by American money, just with they put Japanese businessmen in front of you and you imagine this Japanese find out where the money is coming from they've done this they've eviscerated so many countries to set up their own state there America has never been free Professor Beard who's the man who's researched the Constitution and the whole history of it longer than any other person I've got I refer to him in my DVDs he'll prove it Lysander Spooner prove it you've already it's been proven you've already had men in this country who've done a thorough research into the Constitution to show it's nothing but a Masonic ruse well, when you look at it that way too, and you know, uh, you know, and you're totally correct on that. When we take over a nation, that they are, you know, uh, basically assimilated, you know, in a way, and especially economically. But for every country they do that, think about how many new empires they create with that. That are personal empires, not not you know as a country but a personal empire and you know not only their own but they can also create more stooges for their empires right. and this immense wealth that can of course be kept for hundreds of years at any given time you wipe right. out a nation there's wealth for 10 families for 500 years well when you need to you see when you have to add new layers to your pyramid those layers are, have to be big and and you England is a kind of a small country it's always very vulnerable from attack from within so they wanted a bigger country where it would be less likely that their world system could be, you know, dethroned. And America fits it perfectly. It's a continent. They always wanted a continent. And in Europe, there was so much foment that already oppressed the people to such a degree that they could never be quite sure. And after the First and Second World War, they knew that it's not going to be liable, it's not going to be very good to have the full center of control in a country that is this small because if the world population ever do wake up to rise up, England is the worst place to be in because we could be destroyed. So they still have the steering committee from there. But the wheels of the juggernaut run from America, from the United States of America. Well, Washington, D.C. proves that with their 40-plus uh, zodiacs in the city alone. Uh, there you go. And, and, and then let's just make it understood that those scholars who've researched the Jesuit movement who say that America is not run from Washington, D.C., but it's run from Georgetown University, which happens to strategically overlook Washington, D.C., they're right. What they miss out in what Phelps and these other uh, people who study the Jesuits do not understand is that the Jesuits themselves are but a wing. They're not the, they're not the agents. Uh, they're not the supreme controllers. They themselves, the Vatican itself, Vatican means place of divination or place of sorcery. That edifice, the Vatican, is set up, that's why I have so many Egyptian obelisks, is a vassal, a mere lieutenant of the great cult of Aton. How does this happen? It's the same reason why the words New World Order are really at the bottom of the pyramid. It's, it's only a 50 or 40 percent what other people are telling you. The reason why those words exist is because those are the living words of Akhenaton. 
Now that we have lost Egypt, uh, I'm paraphrasing, I imagine, my imagination can clearly think what these guys were thinking when they were in Sinai, walking through the, the wilderness, the Canaan, with, with a barely anything to drink. The, these are the most powerful men in the world. There's not even people in our world today as powerful as the pharaohs were. And I don't mean powerful just in money and wealth. I mean powerful spiritually, powerful theocracy. Millions and millions of people on their knees. You're talking, you're talking pharaohs here, not kings, not just little pissy nothing, you know, people. When these individuals who are, we're calling the pharaohs, are thrown out of their own land, my God, they are pissed. These are people who have lost everything. And therefore, in the mind of a megalomaniac like Akhenaten and the people who followed him, these sun priests, there's only one thing to appease their shame. And that is to now set the designs on all the other countries of the world. It's the only thing that would make up for losing Egypt. So when they're talking in the Masonic language again, here we go again with Masonic phraseology, the missing capstone, the missing cornerstone, the stone that the builders rejected. Well, who are the builders? The builders are the Egyptians who built the pyramids. Hundreds of, uh, many, many dynasties before Akhenaten. Well, who is the stone that they're rejecting? It's Akhenaten. It's just simple, uh, coded language for saying, we the builders that's the architects of the world who are Egyptian, we are rejecting this stone. It's not Jesus. It's only Jesus because Jesus was in line of the cult of Aton. He was of the seed of David also. But yeah. later on, the missing capstone is Akhenaton himself. These individuals sat at Sinai, and they sat in Babylon, and they sat in Assyria, and they realized nothing is going to fill the void of what we've lost. We can never go back to Egypt. And by the way, we're also renegade in all the other... in all the other... Um, courts of the world who all look to Egypt and are also dependent on Egypt, they're not going to entertain us because they're scared of what the, the new pharaoh will do. So we, we can't even now even work openly. From that moment on, as I said, that's the moment when you have the rise of Judeo-Christianity and the rise of the secret societies, but more specifically, that's the moment when you have a hidden hand. That's the moment when you have people working in the background who can no longer work in, uh, in the open. You know, when you speak of the missing capstone, you know, the builders, you know, it's so ironic, you know, because we have the masons also, which are the builders, and, uh, you know, coming back from ancient Egypt. That's right. And then, um, you know, you look at their temple in Washington, D.C., which has also, you know, got the missing capstone. Which the word is temple comes from Egypt. This temp means time, and El, house of El. The whole, all of this Egyptian symbolism is coming from somewhere. We're just... Focusing in now, you know, we've had the broader picture now for about 50 years or even less. Um, I'm certainly since the time of Eustace Mullins is probably one of the first people who actually started to cons constructively question, you know, the kinds of symbolism that you see in the American milieu. I don't think even before you, I, I, I can't in my own mind think of anyone before Eustace Mullins. And my goodness, that's a very, very short time ago. So this is part of the reason why the work I'm doing has, has had taken time, you know, to come into the consciousness of people because we're dealing with a very short period of time here I keep stressing that and it's very true but what we do need to understand now is the origin of all of this and the, the fact that the people that were cast out and who had no place to rest his head the missing capstone nothing they, they're saying we, the old world order that we knew in Egypt is gone it, it, it's vanished overnight we didn't expect this to happen because megalomaniacs never think they're going to be booted out. I mean, that just comes with the territory, right? So they never thought that they were ever going to be ousted. Oh, no, no, no. They're gathered by God. They think they're going to be there for, a, you know, a thousand-year reign. When they finally find themselves in rags being booted out of the greatest civilization on Earth, literally one minute they have the greatest thrones of the world, and the next minute they're, you know, sucking dust in the desert, the only thing that would appease these individuals is a greater form of megalomania, one that is still active today, believe it or not exactly unadulterated today it's unalloyed the same megalomania which is now we set our designs on a new world order that's why you see those phrases under an Egyptian pyramid with eye of Aton above it it's very simple it's Akhenaten's brainchild to now go to all other continents of the world America fits in perfectly because of course it's a known continent that's large a new Egypt or a new Israel Jews will call it a new Israel and they're not, they're not far wrong it's just the word Israel means more than they understand it to mean. 
Well, again, you make me see more clearly, Michael, and it's so appreciated. It truly is. Uh, well, this information is just astounding, and uh, um, I am so look forward to this new book that you have coming out, too. That just sounds amazing. Well, so. this is an incredible story. You know, it's fusing a lot of facts together, but when you see that Judaic star above the, the American Eagle, realize that neither that star nor that eagle nor those arrows nor that pyramid are, are, are Jewish in nature. And when they're using phrases like Camp David and all of this, what appears to be Judaic symbolism, realize that it is not. That's another lie because they've created a faux Judaism to cover the real Judaism that has always been operating. And this Judaism has been murdering the, the, the religious Jews. And finally, some rabbis are getting onto this idea that why are, why are these religious Jews being persecuted by Jews from New York? Right? Hasn't it come out that the Holocaust was perpetrated by the Jews of New York? That's a, that's a done deal. That's been exposed. Well, I would call. I wouldn't refer to them as the Jews of New York. I've always referred to that as Zionists, though. Right, the Khazars. Yeah, it's been uh, understood by those who studied the Khazar question that the elite Jews of New York and London funded Hitler. Right, the Warburgs, the Jacob Schiffs, the Rothschilds. I'm assuming, of course, that your listeners are aware of this. They better be aware of it if they're not. That these rich elite, so-called Jews, but are really, as you as you rightly said, right-wing Zionist people, you see, we've understood why it is that, we've, we've speculated as to why it is, that they would have sent their own people, quote-unquote, to the gas chambers and to these, these holocausts that took place over there. And it's been very difficult to work that out. It's taken about 50 years for people to get their minds around why that has actually happened. And the, mostly the only thing that you'll ever hear from David Cole, you see, and David Irving and others who studied this, is because it's a class thing. These people were elite Jews, and they didn't care what happened to the lower class Jews. And that's true to a certain extent. But my work goes much, much further than that. It's not that they were Jews. They're not Jews at all. These are individuals working for the royal dynasties of the House of Hesse, the House of Hanover, the House of Guelph, the House of saxe coburg The real Jews with capital J, dating from the time of the cult of Aton. And like I mentioned at the beginning of this, you know, you, you know, the Levites, they're the ones responsible for creating the great religions and, of course, manipulating man within... Their initiates with it, you know, like I said, the Bible, it has some true, it has, all the religions have great morals in them, but they're also filled with deceit. And, but then again, there's truisms to their stories, it's just not how things happened. It was very much earlier in a lot of occasions, or uh, the same story repeating itself, which obviously has meaning behind it. Um, and of course, the symbols, you know, are just amazing. Which today, you know, extremely symbolic day, triple six. And it's a very important for people to realize that some of these uh, religions, the anti-human aspects that have been noted, like the lack of love of nature and the lack of reverence for animals and the lack of reverence for women. And, and well, that would be too new agey, you know. Yeah, and, uh, and I don't understand how they call that new age when I would find that beings of the oldest and nature, and that is in your genetic strand, that is you, and it comes natural. And then we can understand that there's something very off if, if a religion is asking you to do things that are very anti-natural, which unfortunately the religions of the world are definitely asking us to do that. And then that's another sign that there's a control factor at work here, and that these priests and these co ins Cohen is literally means serpent priest. The terms that are being used, temple. You know, many of the of the, the Solomon, all of the Saul. I mean, the dramatis personae. That when we discover that Isaac is the son of a Pharaoh, proven, hands down, irrefutable. When we discover that there was whole dynasties of Israelite pharaohs, you know, we have a transformed. We're no longer laboring. We're, you see, even in 1980, when the Dead Sea Scrolls came out, we're finally released. Yes. Right now, before the before the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, Thomas, the word Gnostic never appeared. So everyone today is talking about Gnostic this, Gnostic that. Before the Dead Sea Scrolls was discovered, no one in this world knew that there was a group of people called the Gnostics. I'm, I'm excluding those elites that we've been talking about on this show, but let's just colloquially say that not a single human scholar ever even knew that such a group called the Essenes or that the Gnostics even existed until those books were discovered. That is a perfect case study for the rest of what I'm saying. Until the discovery 
of the secret of these symbols and the secret symbolism, it, we, we don't even know about the Druids and what the Druids really were. Until the discovery of the Egyptian context, we will not under, we, we have taken time to understand what the atomist, Luciferian principle is. You see? So, just in the same way as that we didn't have knowledge about the Gnostics before the Dead Sea Schools, this is, this is possible. It takes time to uncover certain facts before we have a true, clear picture of the, of the place that we have come and the ship of state. Why it is that so many Egyptian dignitaries end up in Northern Ireland, very, very popular and powerful people from Egypt are buried in Northern Ireland. What on earth would be the reason for that? Why is, you know, symbols from Egypt, uh, all the flags and the heraldry and the insignias and the coats of arms of the royal dynasties of the West, Partly that's because of, they say, the migrations of the ten tribes of Israel, who, of course, those ten migrating tribes are said to have brought that symbolism into Europe. That has proven to be untrue, because the symbols that I'm talking about were in Europe ages before these later tribes migrated there. So, we have questions. My book will also deal with this whole fallacy of the East-to-West movement of civilization. We talked a little bit about this, I think, before, that we've got to turn that around that if the continents of old, like Atlantis and Lemuria, sank in the west, then the survivors of those lost continents set themselves up in Ireland and in Britain, and from there moved out eastward to the rest of the world, in ages past, long, long, long before the rise of any of the history that we know. This is another massive cover-up. These individuals who've covered up the existence of Lemuria and Atlantis, you know, they've gone much further than that. They've even covered up the time that when those continents sank, the survivors came to Britain and moved from there into the West. They've also covered that up. Well, yeah, that, it's like that, that is the reason, Thomas, why official history opens at only you know between seven and eleven thousand years ago. There's a reason why that is. Like we talked about on our last show, when the conquistadors and the Spaniards came through South America and you know taking all of the history. There and it is. There's that's proof. what the the right. Christians this is, not this is to say all Christians. AD. But so this is a process that's been going on. If, if people can have clear understanding of that, 500 A.D., which is so recent, and of course there's been many other examples of this, then it's the same story 5000 B.C. It's exactly the same story. The Vatican later, in the advent of Christianity, prevented people from traveling. They knew intellectual people are itching to find out what's on this planet. They prevented them from traveling, saying the world was flat and you're going to fall off the edge. They didn't want people to go to the West. They didn't want them to go to England and Ireland to discover what civilizations were there. They didn't mind after the Romans had gone there and had slaughtered everybody and eviscerated Irish culture. Oh, now you can go when it's all lost and the temples are destroyed and churches are built on top of ancient sites and the people are massacred in, in their millions and the Druids are killed to a man and, the, and all the books have been stolen and moved to Vatican City. You know, tomorrow, when uh, the Vatican City Library, finally, somebody, uh, uh, all the books are brought out and we find out what's on those libraries, I'm, I'm optimistic enough to think that one day the world will actually know. You know what I also predict? 90% of them will be Irish. Amazing. Yeah, I guarantee you, because there is not a culture on this earth, no Oriental culture, no Asian culture, that has contributed anything to culture. Do you know the Vatican Library? The elements of civilization do not originate in Africa. They do not originate in China. They do not originate in India. And I'm not a racist to say that. The Vatican Library sure. also has the largest porn collection on Earth. Yeah, they do. Uh, every and, they, and this is stated by the Vatican themselves. I know that. That every piece of pornography that is published, they put into the library. Why is something like that? Why would they do that? <laughs> you know... Why would a uh, cardinal, why would a pope ask for a corpse that has been buried for several years to be dug up and brought into, the, into court when they had this crazy court? This pope actually set up a court one day, and one of the characters in the court was a corpse that had been buried for about five years, and they brought this character in as a witness. When did this happen? I've never even heard of this. I got the information. You know, the, 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 believe me, it's only part of the bizarre... Theme. Email me a link to that, please. I'll send you. There's craziness... Uh, inconceivable necro necromancy and evil and degenerate stuff that has been going on out of Vatican City from day one and it's still going on it's like David Icke says it connects to Babylon but you know again the missing piece is yeah Babylon great fine and dandy but you know what about the Egyptian piece these Egyptian symbolisms doesn't come from Babylon so even though there's a Babylonian element to the culture and the iconography of, Babel, of, of uh, what you would call Vatican City 
it is by far Egyptian symbolism. And let me also tell you something else. For those who've been following David Icke's work and the Babylonian connection, the original Babylon wasn't even in Babylon. It was in Cairo in Egypt. Babylon, the original one, was in Egypt, by the way. That's the first I've heard of that. Oh, yeah. That's you know who's the scholar to read on that? Tony Bushby. Really? I, uh, I really Bushby's, like his work, too. In Tony Bushby's books, he shows you that Babylon, which means gateway to On, the sun. Oh. Babe means, like, baby, is gateway, from the gateway. Bab, B-A-B, is an ancient word. In most languages, it means gateway. On is to the sun. It was another sacred city with a tower, a very tall tower, that was outside Cairo, I believe. And the Babylonians, when they invaded Egypt, saw these places. They then mimicked, in Persia, up there in Iran, they mimicked certain cities, and also as homage. Sometimes they had good rapport with the Egyptian pharaohs and wanted to pay homage to Egyptian culture and to the temples there, and they would mimic their temples on Egyptian temples and sometimes even name them the same. Now, the Babylon of the Tower of Babylon is put in front of everybody, and Babylon is Babylon II. Babylon 1, that has long since been destroyed, was outside Cairo in Egypt. So, again, if you're talking about Babylonian infiltration or the elements of uh, Babylonian culture into, you know, the West and what have you, or into Vatican City, let's just realize we're still talking Egypt. It just goes back to Egypt anyway, no matter what. That's amazing information, Michael. That that truly is. That's a that's totally new for me. And yeah, uh, it's documented. Like most of this show. Of the greatest scholars in this world have already documented this. That's great. That's a uh, well. Like I said, I learn so much every time I talk to you. And I sure my listeners the same way. And uh, it's just yeah, you know, it's fabulous information. Um, Again, you know, it's the most interesting times that I could imagine living in, just from the history that I've read in my my lifetime, my short span in this world. Oh, well, I was at the, just came back last week from Conspiracy Con, and uh, the panel, I wasn't a speaker this year, um, one person got up and asked the, the panel, and of course it was Jim Mars was there, Anthony J. Hilder, Jordan Maxwell, uh, you know, Stan Monteith, uh, uh, guess who was there, John D. Kemp, one of my great heroes. Really? But, yeah, okay. very much so. The yeah. uh, the man that exposed the pedophile ring that... Right. Um, he spoke Franklin at Conspiracy Cover Con. Up. That's right. He spoke at Conspiracy Con. His friend Ted Gunderson spoke there. A speaker, uh, a questioner got up and asked a very simple question and said, you know, um, why has it taken so long for us to know about and to even, you know, uh, combat or rival these secret society uh, people? And, um, you know, the, some of the speakers gave various answers, and I don't think that the answer really was the answer I would have given. The answer that I would have given is the answer I give on my DVDs, which is this. There has been no rivalry in the past. The opposition of mankind towards these organizations begins now. Yes, there's been certain individuals in the past, some valiant souls who have stood up against you know, tyranny, but it's, it's been very minor. So when this individual asked about why has the in the past you know the rivalry not succeeded is because there hasn't been any rivalry part of this person's question was kind of born out of historical ignorance point to me a time when secret societies have been combated by the ordinary man it has never happened it doesn't exist we are in the age now of something so remarkable it's almost hard to put into words the, the proactive actual opposition towards these leviathans of ordinary human beings, it starts now, ladies and gentlemen. It begins now. So there is no need for pessimism, fatalism, and oh my goodness, what are we going to do? This We are living in the inception of it. These individuals have been able to operate without, a, even, without even a shred of opposition. They control the whole world and always have done. They were billionaires in the first century A.D. Don't tell me you can build the Vatican you know, and, 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 and have no resources. Or you can put up Venice and Genoa and Padua and Florence and you can set colonies all over the world. We're talking about Atlanteans, 50,000 years old. We're talking about the rise, uh, rising and fall of civilizations like Egypt, for goodness sake, and the rising, uh, rising and falling of cultures like the Druids of Ireland and Rome and Greece. These individuals don't even acknowledge opposition. They've never even experienced it. They don't even know what it is. Well, it's about time we give them some, I say. Right, so. it's coming. You see, this is 
why there's such an importance. That's why when people take it for granted when they're listening to shows like yours, when they're coming on the internet and they're kind of semi-yawning uh, and browsing, you know, David's eye, okay, okay, it's David over here, Michael Tassarn over there, oh, there's this guy, Jordan Maxwell. Yeah, uh, okay, you know, turn the channel. My God, where's the urgency? Where's the reverence? Where's the humility? Where's the, where's the historical concept? I what, what does it take to create an Ezra Pound who would sit in a, a, a Bellevue and Santa Salon for 13 years to pull out a dollar bill, hand it to Eustace Mullins, and go, hey, guy, get your ass down back to that library where you're from and research the symbols on this dollar bill. Time for you to wake up. Well, I'm sure you find, as I do, though, anyone, anyone in this uh, field of study that gets far enough into it to find yourself or Jordan Maxwell or David Icke, um, I believe those people themselves... Uh, no, nothing offensive on the other people either. I'm just saying once you get to a certain level of understanding things, which it just does go higher up as far as the more you learn, you have to go to other researchers to figure out things. That's and right. And there's nothing wrong with that. You, it's, I find the people that I meet, though, that are aware of you folks, and especially you three, especially you three that I've mentioned, um, I find those people I can communicate so much better with than... Like I said, I don't want to be offensive with anyone, but someone who uh, has listened to Alex Jones for the last three or four years, um, it, he has great information, but it's just it's a basic, uh, here's the news, here's my point, they're Masonic, I'm a Christian, buy your Barky water filter, and that's good information if you need an eye-opener, I guess, but I truly find the people who find you and and can study the information and swallow it, and are able to swallow it, um, they're destined, I believe, just to further themselves in finding the truth. And I, I truly believe in my lifetime, I don't think I'll know uh, anywhere close to it all, but I'll know enough to where I can... I'm at ease as now, just with the information I'm aware of. I am truly at ease, and that's a great feeling in itself. Well, knowledge is always power. And as I said, the ultimate war of all of this, taken in totality is the war against human consciousness. Not just the consciousness of the collective, but the consciousness of individuals. It's a war against your personal consciousness, your personal sovereignty, and everybody who's listening to the show, forget about other people for a moment. The war that is going on is, is against you, individually, you. It's like that poster where they're pointing, you know, your country needs you. It's like that. It's right in your face. This is a war against you. When you know that, then you act then you realize that, my goodness, I'm not going to allow these people to take away my brain. I'm not going to be stamped, indexed, filed, briefed, debriefed, or numbered. I'm going to live my own life, and my life is my own. You realize that. It's not a political fight. It is not a religious fight. That's all been created as a smokescreen. That's all based on co op Yeah, they've taken everything from us as is. The last thing we have is our, what I would say is our essence. And that's what needs to go. That's what they want to go. And, of course, you, you have the right to let it go. Nobody can take it from you. You must give it up. Many people have given it up. Others are slowly awakening. See, the Alex Joneses and the people that you talk about who have a sort of a limited, you know, uh, version or understanding of this, that's perfectly all right because that's, that's the level that they are getting from awakening. These people are gradually awakening. I have the privilege of coming from a metaphysical background and not from any other place of study or work or awareness. So I don't know what it is to not be into any of this stuff. So I credit individuals who come from these incredibly restricted, very retentive, very ar arrested, you know, coteries of, of Judeo-Christianity or from school, from Western systems, to even get as far as what Alex Jones is, is a miracle that people can do that. That, ta that. that takes some doing. And that, to me, is the barometer of what I just said a few minutes ago. The fact that even ordinary people, householders, are learning about Freemasons, secret societies, the, the true history of America, the Federal Reserve, the, uh, you know, the plagues, the wars, the history, the occult history of the world is phenomenal. It has never occurred and you in do this have world. To learn, you do have to learn those things first. You, you truly do. do. And think about all the millions of people who came before you from the feudal times all the way down you know, through the First and Second World War, who didn't know anything about this. They had no television, they had no radio, they barely read a newspaper. My goodness, they could barely read. The only book they had in their house was the Bible. They had no frame of reference. There was no commentary on the Bible. There was, the, the commentary on the Bible is basically the late 19th century it really began, and, and, and even then it was pathetic. 
without the Dead Sea Scrolls being discovered, we, we you know, which is 1940 for goodness sake, and by the time they released it, it was already 1980. So give ourselves a break. People need to really not feel pessimistic, but incredibly optimistic. Very much like what Lieutenant Colonel James Bo Grites always used to say. You know, it's like feel good about the time that you're living in right now. It's very important to do that. We're dealing with revelations that are within 10, 20 years they've only been made. What do you think of Bill Greitz uh, um, as far as him being a Mason, though, also? I mean, I know many Freemasons. Is he an unaware Mason, or is he... No, he is a Freemason. But is he an unaware Mason, is what I'm saying. He is aware. But see, joining Freemason from the street level, or joining the Rosicrucians from the street level, is, is, is meaningless, basically. And that does not have anything to do with the kind of Freemasons that I'm addressing. Their center in San Jose is pretty creepy, the Rosicrucians, their headquarters. Well, I know that center very well. I used to go there a lot. It's a very interesting place. I imagine it probably is built on a vortex. And there's some lovely, great, incredibly spiritually endowed people who work there. And then you have some corrupt, uh, money-grubbing, anti-spiritual, you know, fakers hiding behind the rose and the cross who should be serving humanity like, as you know, Spencer Lewis, and others did you know that Spencer Lewis gave free lectures every Monday or something like that really yeah free lectures to the public on spirituality and morality and Egyptian philosophy and stuff like that free without fail from his nothing wrong that's a wonderful thing I mean anything to encourage knowledge and learning that's what he did they opened libraries they had available stuff there you know and now the administration of those organizations and I happen to know this from personal experience is the most ruthless corrupt decadent thieving embezzling creatures on the face of the earth. Oh, yeah, it's like in Kathy O'Brien's book, uh, Transformation of America, she speaks of uh, Chris Christopherson, I won't go into detail with it, um, but, you know, it's extremely bad, and into the mind control, and uh, and a lot of the Rosicrucians are in on the MK Ultra program, and the Project Monarch program. And Long what, before I even heard of, of Kathy, uh, before I met her, and uh, knew about Bryce Taylor, and uh, Arizona Wilder, and the whole nine yards. I already knew that the the uh, movement in this country that is your what you call your uh, country and western, yes, uh, milieu or whatever idiom, whatever you want to call it, out of out of Tennessee, out of that. Uh, where am I thinking of? In Nashville and exactly Nashville yeah. was riddled with Satanists. You know, I've, I've always had a meter for that because I've been studying it for many many decades now, especially from an Irish context. So I've got a meter that can tell just through the symbolism and through other you know cues. I'm going to be flying there Thursday, actually, and i got to spend two and a half hours in Denver International Airport. So uh, That's not healthy, is No, I don't, I don't think so either. <laughs> well, I, I'm 100% convinced, just in case you know, anyone wants to know, I'm 100% convinced. I know Ted Gunderson personally. We've, we've had hours of conversations. I'm familiar with all of his work, and I'm very familiar with all of this stuff connecting to uh, what you have in this country being released by... Kathy and, and Arizona and others. This is very familiar to me. I've been researching this stuff in, in a European context for a long, long time, and it is not news to me. This stuff is very ancient. It's like Ted, Ted has said many times. It is thousands of years in the making. It predates the, the origins of America. It's another piece of this that goes back to the ritualistic idea. It goes back to the war on consciousness, the sacrificial idea of leaking negative emotions so that people do not rise up. Because, you see, the rising up of the opposition that we've been discussing would have taken place. I mean, I'm just finished saying that it hasn't taken place. But, you see, it would have taken place if there had not been a constant barrage of toxicity from on high to make sure that it didn't take place. And part of that barrage is the fear, the anxiety, the trepidation, the bloodlust. You see, the sacrificing of, of our pure bloods in war so that you only have basically the lowest level of the genetic human left which makes it, of course, that person is not as endowed as the people who died on the fields of war. That's just a simple genetic fact. If you've lost the genetic strength of your race... Oh, yeah, you lose 60% of your men. Yeah, and if you do that, then who? you've lost your courage, you've lost the bravery, you've, le- you've, you've lost the power to stand up against the tyrants. That's and why course, these wars are orchestrated. Yeah, and they do uh, take the strongest men for soldiers, so... Yeah, that's right, and, they can, and of course, they concoct any reason to get these kinds of uh, Scots-Irish blood to go out and die because any reason will do the main idea uh, the main idea is get them to die i mean get them to die now because you, you can't inherit a new world order if you've got these very highly individual people who've got war in their blood who fought kings and tyrants for generations you're not going to have your new world order american or other with this kind of stock racially ethnically you know 
in existence. Yeah. What do you do? You spend about 100 years or more. I mean, you can go back to the 30 Years' War, the 100 Years' War, the various wars that have taken place ever since. Uh, then you can come up to the, the, the huge genocidal holocaust of the First and Second World War. What was that? You know what that was? A simple blood ritual to get rid of the strongest genetic strain so that, it, that what's left is extremely easy to control. So when you're looking around at the state of decay in the world today, and people listening to the garbage on the radio and the garbage on the television, uh, the, basically the zombification of, of America and the rest of it, there's also a genetic reason as to why that has happened, why in one or two generations we have people who don't know anything and who don't want to know anything and probably we couldn't even act even if it was spelt out to them. There's a reason for that. And you're not gonna, that's why we said at the beginning of the show, don't waste your energy breathing it into somebody who's not a whole person, who's so genetically weak that if you try to implant them with the information you know, they'd probably they short circuit in their own brain. And they because can even be directly related to you. So. They couldn't relate. And I will, I will stress this, this last point, which I think is monumentally important and is like a rallying cry. It's something that all people who are setting themselves up to combat, this is, this is a message for the combatants. And I mean, if you're a combatant against the New World Order, or you're a combatant against world evil, and I don't care what denomination or religion you come from, my words now are going to matter. And it is this. The enemy is the least of your worries. Your problem is the people from within your own movement who are weak, ineffectual, misinformed, duplicitous, cowardly, or deceptive, or double agents or whatever this is a, this is known to every general and every commander of an army who is intelligent and who's done his homework and knows that the enemy is the least of your problems the dark side know this that's why they have a hundred percent allegiance they have an incredible filtration system to make sure that they don't have to question the allegiance of the people that are fighting on their side you see that's why they like that robotic type of thing that they do show you in Star Wars and some of these sci-fi shows. They don't see fear or doubt or duplicity it's or a... sickness or, double or, or, or second thoughts in the eyes of their minions. We see that on our side. So we need to set up a situation in which we are super aware of the kind of commitment and the kind of ardor and the kind of passion and the kind of wherewithal of our own ranks before you even concern yourself with what the enemy is doing. Now, this should be familiar to anyone who's got military training and background. They're going to be nodding their heads right now going, absolutely, he's right. But I'm talking to the mass of mankind here who, who may have forgotten this fact. That if you're going out to the OK Corral, and there's three of you, then that can be an army of three. If each person is focused on what they need to do, and there's no fear and no duplicity, and it's completely, you know facing ground zero and knows what's going on. But if you have Judases in your rank, and if you have misinformed, duplicitous, weak souls, then you better know how to test for those souls because they're your liability. That's in any war, and it is even more so in the war that we have now to fight, which is, as I've always said, an intellectual war. It's a war that is, is, is won by knowing your enemy and by knowing something about the mindset of that enemy when you know that these masons and these individuals believe that they are on their knees in front of a pharaoh a shining god then you can perhaps understand why there is no breaking of the ranks why politician after politician after politician and liar after liar after liar and deceiver and deceiver can come one on top of the other and can sign with a pen the slaughter of whole nations and peoples and, and, and initiate wars you see and initiate suppression and do all the miserable rotten things that they do we understand why this is if, if they think that they are minions of or they are their leader is this super solar being it's something to really contemplate and you put yourself in, in the position of those people to think that if you really had Christ in front of you you really thought that they could prove it to you when they really reveal to you the keeper of the royal secret that these are your intellectual and, and uh, technical and industrial masters who've moved the whole of history forward. My God, all knees will bend. All kings will rule through me. 
as they say. This is one of the reasons. This is one of the reasons why the, from the top of the pyramid down, there's an enormous, uh, you know, allegiance. But for us on the other side, for us who are the renegades, the guerrillas, the guerrilla fighters, we had better be fully immune. Meaning, we got to know what are the motives of the people that are me meant to be fighting within our own ranks. Because we might be mighty surprised about that. I'd say a great source of knowledge, if you would like to know more on that even, uh, would be The Art of War. Yeah. Um, that's a wonderful book. Um, it's not what you would think by title even. It's uh, more of a philosophy. That's right. Um, but it's an amazing philosophy. And I, I recommend getting, again, you know, reading Lord of the Rings or getting those three movies out. If anyone yeah. wanted a crash course in the worm tongue scenario, which is what I'm talking about, just observe that movie and find out... Uh, this concept of the evil in your own ranks, the betrayal from within. I mean, if you didn't get it from film noir, then at least, you know, let's go to Tolkien, the latest brilliant movies there. It's this whole idea of betrayal from within. You know, uh, one of your Jesus, videos, which Jesus I haven't Christ. gotten yet, Pardon? Uh, one of your videos, which I haven't gotten yet out of your, out of your new series, uh, Origins and Oracles, um, I haven't got the subversive, uh, subversive use of uh, media yet. Um, or symbols in media. I'm sorry, I've messed that up twice so far. Um, I know I have watched the Conspiracy Con from a few years back. I believe it was 2002 or three, um, when you talked about it for a few hours. Um, but today, uh, 666, there was two films released, and um, now obviously they're kind of pretty much obvious reasons. But I found it quite, I don't know just very Hollywood of them to release these two films today and one was The Omen the remake uh -huh. and the second one was called Triple Six The Beast I see and um, the Triple Six The Beast I have not seen any trailers for it and I'm not sure where it's playing I know they have a huge website and they have a trailer for it and apparently it's uh, supposed to be basically um, debunking Christianity um, so, um, <laughs> I so just all I can say about the 666 is that it is uh, one of many secret society emblems. It's nothing special, really. I mean, it, um, it, it's just one of many insignias, number symbolisms that they use. And why, would, why do the Christians uh, make it such a heavy... I mean, obviously, it's because of the book of Daniel. And uh, or is that in Re it's in Daniel, isn't it, where it's referenced as six six or the six 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 references? Oh, it's the book. Of, I think it's the uh, book of Revelation. Is it Revelation? Okay, I was thinking but, it might have been Daniel. But it's known to the elites within Judaism. It, they use Kabbalistic um, interchange between letters and words, where certain letters stand for certain words. It's what's called gematria. Uh huh. And this is very much used by secret societies. And in 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 uh, Hebrew, in Hebrew. The, the term Nezer Ha Kodesh, right? Nezer Ha Kodesh. They can see it if they go to my website, the Astro Theology pages on the Telescope's website. They'll see reference to this. Because the term in Hebrew, Nezer Ha Kodesh, does add up to 666. But the interesting thing is, what does the term Nezer Ha Kodesh mean? The Holy Crown. Really? Relating again, in my estimation, to the Holy Crown, the Crown of Akhenaten. So 666 oh. is nothing more. It's not the beast. It's a, it's a symbol of the Egyptian Atonist cult, the Holy Crown, through whom I shall reign. All kings will reign through my Holy Crown. This is the crown that you see above the double-headed eagle, the crown you see you know, on so many insignias, the crown that the kings physically wear. It's the crown of Aton. It's the crown in the, crown in the cross of the uh, Scottish Rite Freemasons, you see. Oh, yeah, the eagle is landed type thing. Exactly. So this uh, 666, no, this is a, nothing more than another insignia for Akhenaten and his solar cult. Now, have you been to the temple in Washington, D.C.? No, I've never been to Washington, D.C. I, I haven't been. I've been to D.C. I have not been to the temple there, though, and I don't know if it's true, um, but I've heard that there is a picture of uh, um, Armstrong, who is a 33rd degree mason, on the moon with his apron. Oh, yeah, I have pictures of that, all right. Uh, sure, they did a whole... And me remember, when he was on the moon, so-called, I don't even believe yeah, he was so on the called. moon, but... I heard um, the guy who uh, directed... Uh, oh, God, now what was the name of it? Um, Peter Sellers' movie. I'll remember his name here in a minute, but uh, I heard he was the, his famous director, and uh, he was the one who directed it, so... Mm. Um, I'm trying to think of his name. I'm just having a total brain fart right now, and I'm embarrassed about it. Um, 
Oh, it wasn't Polanski. It was uh, he he created a Peter Sellers movie. It had oh, a Kubrick. Flint Pickens, Kubrick. Kubrick. Kubrick, Stanley Kubrick. Yes, I heard he was the one who directed the moon landing. Well, that wouldn't surprise me. That's very interesting. So, but I do know that the plant, the star Sirius, which is extremely important in uh, the cult of Aton and 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 also the dog Christian, star. Uh, he that that star Sirius was at its highest point when they they did that Masonic uh, you know symbol when they did that American uh, yeah when they did this when they did the inauguration of the moon for not for America or Britain or anywhere else but for the Masonic lodge incredible as it may seem anyway well, it makes you even wonder you know about the moon landing even more being fake oh I believe it was fake uh, there's it, no doubt in my mind about that I mean that's pretty much you know, let's stand that's, down that's yeah no brainer the science to say that there's no way on earth that they could have got to the moon. I enjoyed that gentleman that made that documentary where he went and uh, got hit by Buzz Aldrin. Um, yeah. The way he had made him swear on the Bible. That was yeah. too funny. I yeah. I truly enjoyed that documentary. I had made customers at uh, my grandmother's bar watch that on several occasions. So. Okay, well, Thomas, if there's no more questions, I think we can wrap it up, huh? There you go, folks. It's a wrap. So I thank you for tuning in to The Bunker tonight. Um, again, I thank our guest, Michael Tessarian, for coming and spending as much time as he did with us again. And I look forward to our next visit. Um, again, you've been listening to From the Bunker here on RevereRadioNetwork.com. And I'll catch everybody next Saturday. Peace.